Over the course of history, different forms of media have risen to prominence. Books, radios, film, and television dominated the planet until the birth of the internet. And within the internet, a new form of media rose to prominence, a type of immersive storytelling called unfiction. Stories told as if they're real, with you as part of the story. Within this new form of media, many trends have come and gone as it's evolved in its own bubble. Written stories called creepypastas, a shared universe of found footage web series called the Slenderverse, cryptic puzzles made or inspired by the mysterious Cicada 3301 group. However, in recent years, one trend has slowly grown from a niche subgenre to the dominant form of unfiction, taking over the field and dominating the internet at large in an unprecedented way. It's a subgenre that harkens back to old mediums of the past. It's a subgenre now known as analog horror. My name is Alex Hera. I'm a filmmaker, documentarian, and a creator of unfiction, including a project in this subgenre. I'll be your narrator in this documentary as we explore the mechanisms of the genre, interview creators, and chronicle the history of analog horror. So in my eyes, analog horror must, first and foremost, be using analog technology. Analog horror is a subgenre of found footage horror. Analog horror is any horror medium that utilizes an analog broadcast or tape or film aesthetic. Analog horror is any sort of horror media that uses VHS uh, video technology and aesthetic. Anything that is in like a, an old damaged VHS style. A form of... Found footage. Found footage, but it takes the aesthetic of um, the VHS, VCR, uh, staticky analog era of television to uh, deliver the required, you know, instability that a lot of horror is, uh, needs to function, where you don't trust the medium because there are problems, there are glitches. It uniquely uses the limitations of the medium, such as its low resolution. Rough around the edges, I guess you could say. There's like imperfections in like the medium, so like the graininess, the like what we call like the snow, um, VHS snow. That invoke a feeling of fear and dread. A narrative is conveyed through an analog format. For example, broadcast by analog signal, VHS tape. TV broadcasts. Um, Camera footage. It must harken back to the days of cathode ray tube television sets, VCRs, cameras that utilize tape. A thing that's being played back is an actual physical like medium instead of just like a file or that you might see in a digital thing. It's got to be pre-digital. That's that's the kind of error that we're looking at. I, I would say unfiction is definitely a, a big part that plays into analog horror. Before we begin exploring the history of analog horror, we first need to define what it is. The idea of analog horror is incredibly vast. The name suggests that this is any type of horror that uses a retro or analog aesthetic, but in practice, that definition stretches far wider than the actual genre, and everyone seems to have their own ideas of what it is. Let's focus on that last part though, unfiction. Analog horror is, for the most part, a subgenre of unfiction online stories that insist that they are real, and dedicate themselves to seeming as convincing as possible, with in-character writing, found footage videos, and more. Analog horror with immersive viewer interaction are known as analog horror alternate reality games, or ARGs. Those without interaction are simply analog horror web series. Now, the line between an unfiction web series and a found footage web series is a blurry one, depending on various opinions and immersive elements that are or aren't included, but right now, that's not important. To simplify the definition a little more, 
We typically think of analog horror as modern digital videos that recreate the poor quality of degraded live broadcasts, VHS tapes, or other analog media from the late 1900s and early 2000s, which makes up what we'll call the analog aesthetic. The content could be that of a stylized live TV program, advertisement, camcorder video, or something else entirely. The only hard rule is that it replicates what you would see in the time of analog technology, with error-appropriate visual styles and music like smooth jazz or Muzak. The footage is meant to be unsettling in nature, containing some sort of unnerving or horrific plot often hiding just under the surface. It commonly involves supernatural or even Lovecraftian elements that become more apparent over time, sometimes through the use of TV broadcast hijackings. Now, keep in mind that all of that is just a baseline definition, and there are many exceptions that we'll dive into later. In the end, the key takeaway is that analog horror is defined by its use of the analog aesthetic, and how it adds to the unsettling nature of the story. Today, analog horror is perhaps the most popular and influential development to ever happen in unfiction, and because of that we have some important questions to answer, such as how did we land on the current definition of analog horror? Why is analog horror an unfiction subgenre? What made this subgenre become so popular in recent years? Those questions can't be solved until we ask one far more important, overarching question, though. When did it start? Let's rewind to the beginning. The real beginning. Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. New York City, October 30, 1938. By this point in history, a small number of TV stations had begun appearing in the United States, but radio was the dominant form of media. On this particular Sunday, a radio play called War of the Worlds aired on the Columbia Broadcasting System station, created by a man named Orson Welles. The story of this infamous broadcast is well documented, but in short, it was an adaptation of the novel War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, with a slight twist. It was designed to be told in an entirely immersive way, at least for the first half. This type of radio play had been attempted in Britain and Australia before this, but War of the Worlds had the largest impact. It takes on the format of average everyday radio broadcasts, which are periodically interrupted by news bulletins of an alien invasion, slowly getting more intense, frequent, and terrifying, until the news bulletins permanently interrupt the broadcast to document the alien takeover. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Orson Welles' War of the Worlds terrified the country, and it served as an important moment for both unfiction and analog horror, due to its place as one of the first documented immersive live broadcast projects, carrying many of the traits that would later become key to immersive media as a whole. Like modern unfiction, War of the Worlds was an experimental project many enjoyed and that even terrified some who thought it was real due to how realistic its presentation was. For analog horror specifically, it contains the corruption of realistically created live broadcasts, something seen in almost every project in the subgenre today. Though, of course, modern analog horror trends more towards recreating analog television than analog radio. This is all thanks to the 1950s golden age of analog television. Over the course of the mid-20th century, radio declined in popularity as television rose to dominance. From 1950 to 1959, in only nine years, the amount of American households with a television rose from 9% to 85%. The future was set in stone, and from this point onwards, television dominated media, and culture as a whole. This sets the stage for the release of David Cronenberg's Videodrome in 1983. The film tells the story of a TV executive, Max Wren, who gets involved with a mysterious, small-time television program called Videodrome. This program contains people being tortured and softcore pornography. Moreover, it's later revealed to cause brain tumors while you watch it, and it eventually drives the main character to shoot himself at its order. Yes, you heard that right. Analog horror partially owes its success to softcore porn. Many of the themes of the later analog horror subgenre are seen and possibly even originate with Videodrome. While these themes are difficult to explain this early in the timeline, much of analog horror deals with the harmful effects of media consumption. Everyone has heard that television rots your brain, and over the years we've seen how modern media harms society in a multitude of ways. 
Videodrome embodies the ideas and fears about this subject matter more than most, and in the same way that analog horror and modern media like Black Mirror do. It plays with the idea of harmful stimuli from sinister analog broadcasts that can physically harm you, threaten you, mentally corrupt you, and speak directly with you while you watch. It's a concept commonly seen in the analog horror project we'll explore over the course of this documentary, alongside the concept of horrific, disturbing, unregulated live TV programs as a whole. In the words of director David Cronenberg, As a kid, we had a television set with an antenna that rotated, and you could rotate it from inside your house. And you, when the major channels would go off the air, you could rotate it and pick up strange other channels from smaller cities around from across the border in Buffalo and so on. And you would see strange things that were kind of hard to see. There was a lot of static and it was very intriguing to watch that kind of thing. And that was really the, the core, the crystal at the center of this movie was my experience with that, thinking, well, what if the images that you pulled up were really quite extreme, disturbing, uh, possibly illegal? And what would you think then? Videodrome wasn't the first, last, or even the most well-known movie to use TV as a horror concept. When most people think of terrifying television, they think of 2002's The Ring. However, Videodrome was one of the most influential on analog horror, and its themes and designs are eerily similar to the subgenre of today. As a result of the times, analog media was already being used for horror in the 1980s. In its own way, Videodrome planted the seeds for the themes of the future subgenre. But this was only the beginning, and things were not about to slow down. As they said in the film, On with the new flesh. Chicago, Illinois, the night of November 22nd, 1987. This is when the famous Max Hedrum incident occurred. Two TV stations, WGN-TV and WTTW, were hijacked mid-program. A man imitating the British TV character Max Headroom appeared, and in short, sub-two-minute broadcast intrusions, he made various odd comments before disappearing forever. He was never caught. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. While the content of these intrusions wasn't disturbing in nature, it was incredibly unsettling, and it became a very well-known urban legend. The same could be said for the Captain Midnight broadcast hijacking that occurred a year prior, on April 27, 1986. Captain Midnight was even less unsettling than Max Headroom, simply displaying color bars and a text message, but it was still a bizarre, off-putting event seen by the entire eastern United States. These broadcast hijackings became legendary, unsettling, and terrifying for those who watched and for those who learned of the events after the fact. They became direct inspirations for several analog horror projects in the following decades. And in fact, the decade following it, the 1990s, were a flashpoint for immersive storytelling and, in retrospect, for the origins of the future analog aesthetic. London, October 31st, 1992. An immersive live television program aired on the BBC called Ghost Watch. Ghost Watch told the story of several supposed documentarians investigating a haunted house live on air on Halloween night, with some crew members remaining in the studio to monitor their progress and even answer calls from supposed viewers. However, things in the program begin to go horribly wrong for everyone involved. Paranormal events terrify and even injure the documentarians in the house, supposedly real call-in viewers begin to report increased paranormal activity, Eventually, even the entire studio is overtaken with paranormal events, and the broadcast ends abruptly. This excellent immersive film blurred the lines between reality and fiction. Like many unfiction projects that would come along in the future, Ghostwatch used the idea of viewer interaction and the manipulation of a live broadcast to immerse viewers into its story. It was said to terrify all of Britain, and it was remembered for decades after it first aired. In the end, the concept of a real, live broadcast portraying these events was the catalyst for this terror. The analog quality and execution of the story, cinematography, and editing contribute to the realism of the film. Clearly, it was something that stuck with people, and its influence, direct or indirect as it is, can be felt through the hundreds of modern analog horror projects that use the manipulation of a supposedly live broadcast to evoke similar feelings of terror. Seven years after Ghost Watch, in 1999, the horror-found-footage film The Blair Witch Project released, 
leading to the popularization of the found footage film genre and becoming one of the key founding pieces of unfiction. The Blair Witch Project became a common inspiration and template that professional and independent filmmakers, storytellers, and game designers from 1999 onwards would use to tell immersive fiction stories online, and they would eventually take on the name Unfiction. The Blair Witch Project was presented as a true story about several students lost in the woods with nothing but a camera while attempting to make a film about the legendary Blair Witch. While this was immersive in and of itself, the creators also made and released a fake documentary about the legend of the Blair Witch that aired on TV before the release of the film. A website was even created to further the legend in this documentary. With this, a transmedia story was unfolding, and all of the core elements of future unfiction projects were set in place. Blair Witch wasn't the first ARG or even the first unfiction project, but it was one of the first to insist that it was real, and go through the effort to keep up that illusion, combining found footage, realistic marketing, and in-universe websites. However, its significance to unfiction as a whole isn't the only reason we're talking about Blair Witch. This film, of course, has the so-called analog aesthetic during all of the footage, due to it being produced in a time where analog equipment was still in use. Though. Blair Witch wouldn't be considered the start of analog horror, not any more than previously discussed projects like Ghostwatch or other found footage films of the time like The Last Broadcast. Instead, analog horror actually began nearly a decade later in 2006 with an unassuming video in Creepypasta called The Wyoming Incident. Creepypastas were, at this time, basically the peak of internet horror, a collaborative space made up of complex and often immersive stories. It was many people's first introduction to internet horror, horror in general, and especially to horror creation. It was an easily accessible medium with a low barrier of entry that served as the foundation for many beginners first projects, just like analog horror is in the modern day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. When it comes to the Wyoming incident, the original video is long gone. It was released alongside a creepypasta written about a broadcast intrusion that contained videodrome-esque harmful frequencies, causing headaches, vomiting, and hallucinations. This was of course blatantly false, and there was no such frequency, but it added to the air of mystery around the video, and kept people speculating. The clip itself does portray a broadcast hijacking, extremely reminiscent of the real-life Max Headroom and Captain Midnight incidents. However, this project turns the horror up a notch beyond what we saw in the real world. The Wyoming incident uses VHS effects alongside terrifying faces from deep within the uncanny valley. Now, we'll put the rest of that ARG aside since it does go really off the rails, but the video itself was immensely terrifying, both in 2006 and the present day. It earns its place in history as one of the first unfiction videos on YouTube and as one of the first in the analog horror subgenre, though that label, the community, and the widespread nature of the format wouldn't exist for almost 10 more years. That is certainly one of the oldest things that I've got on record for what I've covered that kind of touches that kind of uh, area. The Wyoming incident was far too old to even be able to judge its impact. Now, after it's been resurfaced through the retelling of the story online and the spread of the story online, it could certainly have influence, but I can't say that I'd be able to measure that comparative to what we're seeing now in the field. Regardless of its impact, it's important to understand why the Wyoming incident gets to be called the first analog horror project. And to do that, we need to take a second look at what we've covered so far. There is one reason that War of the Worlds, Ghost Watch, The Blair Witch Project, and others are not considered analog horror. They're true analog creations. What separates these early works from the subgenre we know today is something quite simple. Analog horror is not analog. Instead, it's a digital recreation of analog mediums, created with modern programs like Adobe Premiere and others. It mimics the terror of live broadcasts gone wrong like we saw in Ghostwatch and War of the Worlds, or in the real-life Max Headroom incident. It mimics the feeling of being lost in the woods in a pre-internet, pre-GPS age like we saw in the Blair Witch Project. But it is merely mimicking, and the genre is defined by its purposeful recreation of these formats. It's defined by how it's designed to evoke a sense of nostalgia for a bygone age, whereas something that's an actual part of the age can't be designed to evoke nostalgia yet. This is the exact reason why the Wyoming Incident is the first entry in the analog horror subgenre that we can identify. 
It's not an analog creation, but it uses real formats and the analog aesthetic for the purposes of creating a certain atmosphere, mainly horror. In the Wyoming incident, broadcast hijackings, unsettling text, and the uncanny valley exist as a basis for its horror, which is a formula reused in many modern analog horror projects. We'll see many of these ideas and forms of mimicry come to fruition in the next few years of our timeline, as we get closer to the formation of the modern analog horror subgenre. We're not there yet, though. In the end of the 2000s, following the Wyoming incident, the idea of analog horror didn't gain any real traction. However, things were slowly brewing, and in 2009, the Slenderman Focus founder of the modern unfiction and ARG field, Marble Hornets, burst into existence. Marble Hornets was the project that led to the birth of the Slenderverse, which was, as Evan Santiago beautifully put it in his Slenderverse video essay, art for everyone. The Slenderverse was another collaborative online storytelling space reminiscent of Creepypasta a shared universe of online unfiction based around the Slenderman character, which, as Evan said, provided a template or a beginner's guide to allow first-time or otherwise inexperienced creators to experiment and take their first steps into film and unfiction, with a framework to support them and lower the barrier of entry. And this is a place that analog horror would take a little less than a decade later. It's important to keep in mind, when looking through unfiction and analog horror in particular, that many creators take heavy inspiration from the other projects in their niche, and use them as an inspiration to begin their very own first projects, before they branch out and become pioneers themselves. Everybody's gonna start somewhere, and it's very intimidating to look at the history of what's come before, and look at the practical idea of, I can sit at my desk, and I alone can learn how to work this program, edit, put things together, and put them out, versus let me get a camera and then run out there with my friends and go to locations and hopefully not have police called on us and then come back and edit it and put it together and hope somebody cares about it. Anything that gets somebody's foot in the door when it comes to actual creativity is good for them. You know, it's it proves I have the ability to do something. If it's just me at the computer and I can put something together and people like it, that shows to me I have potential. And that will be the confidence that I would need as a creator to go forward and do something bigger that takes a better commitment. Creepypastas served this purpose, and at this point in the 2010s, the Slenderverse served that purpose. You'll see the pattern continue with analog horror soon enough. In the meantime, Marble Hornets was shaking up the unfiction scene and the internet as a whole, though its place within analog horror is up for some debate. Marble Hornets kicked off with a whole bunch of tapes that were, you know, technically analog technology. It was tape for the camera that was being used. And so exploring those, being able to play those back using that kind of older technology and then putting it online and putting it into a digital format, that is a route there. In its own way, it could be considered analog horror, but it was far from the design choices, tropes, and general style that make up what we call analog horror in the modern day, as it emphasizes the modern found footage aspect far more than anything analog. Other horror web series with analog aesthetics were slowly popping up too, like Skeleton Creek by Patrick Carmen. The movement was growing, even if they didn't fit in with the thematic or design principles of the modern analog horror subgenre. And the label placed upon them doesn't increase or diminish their importance either way. Whether you call them proto-analog horror or call them the first analog horror, they were incredibly important and crucial for the evolution of the subgenre. However, they weren't the only important thing happening at this time. In the 2000s and the early 2010s, there was an incredibly important cultural and musical movement forming. Vaporwave. This began with hypnagogic pop in the 2000s, music using elements from the 70s, 80s, and 90s for nostalgic purposes. Over the course of a decade, hypnagogic pop continued to evolve, spawning other retro musical movements like Chillwave, which were becoming more noticed and popular and properly defined around 2009. And then, boom. 2010, Kavinsky comes out with his new single, Night Call. The film Drive uses it in 2011, and Synthwave, alongside its attached visual aesthetic Outrun, explodes onto the scene. And it's amazing. 
But also in 2011, Vaporwave kicked off with Laserdisc Visions and its attached visual aesthetic called Aesthetic. Yes, with all the spaces. When it comes to Synthwave and Vaporwave, there are some shared traits, such as analog effects, retro-styled music, and bright flashy colors in their aesthetics, which are all elements used heavily in analog horror. Synthwave and the Outrun aesthetic are largely reminiscent of the 80s more than any other decade. It often focuses on the style of 80s action film soundtracks and uses a darker color scheme. On the other hand, Vaporwave and Aesthetic focus on the early internet, concepts of consumerism and capitalism, and largely things from the 90s. Musically, it often samples or reuses music from the 1900s, or it recreates New Age or Muzak, and visually it mostly uses pastel colors. In the early 2010s, Synthwave and Vaporwave were spreading like wildfire across the internet, especially Vaporwave. It was causing a massive resurgence in nostalgia for the 80s and 90s, and creating interest in the aesthetic and ideas of the genres, their relation to analog technology, and eventually, to analog horror. When people heard uh, Macintosh Plus's floral shop, like everyone wanted in on, and so you just had like all this stuff just come in, and then like it's basically it's almost like overload of new content. I'd say like with regards to that kind of appeal to the nostalgia of like the '80s '90s time frame, especially when consumer electronics like VHS and uh, other similar technologies were more prevalent. There's a shared nostalgia route between vaporwave and analog horror. Today, Vaporwave and Aesthetic is the movement most commonly associated with analog horror, with videos in the subgenre today often using New Age music, 80s Muzak, or even modern music like Vaporwave that imitates Muzak, alongside pastel colors and plenty of examples of early internet or anti-consumerism themes. It's one half of the analog horror soundscape, with the other of course being retro TV and VHS tape effects. And of course, analog horror evokes nostalgia for the analog age, extremely similarly to the nostalgia that Vaporwave, Synthwave, and other retro musical movements hoped to achieve as well. In total, Vaporwave had a massive influence on analog horror, but not only in its content. Without the success of Vaporwave or Synthwave, and the analog retro nostalgia-based aesthetics being developed within, analog horror might not exist. There is undeniable shared DNA, and it definitely deserves credit for its influence on the future subgenre. To sum it up, before the subgenre ever even existed, analog technology was used to evoke feelings of nostalgia and feelings of terror, either through the use of legitimate technology from the age or the recreation of that technology in the 2000s. The first analog horror video graced the internet in this period, as well as a few other projects that are debatably part of the analog horror scene or proto-analog horror. And beyond that, two previous collaborative online storytelling spaces rose to prominence and let novice creators take their first steps. And this is where we leave prehistory and jump into the more linear evolution of the subgenre. Over the next 10 years, from 2012 to 2022, analog horror would grow from essentially one video, a sense of nostalgia, and a developing aesthetic to the massive, multi million viewer unfiction subgenre that we now know today. Back then, when Marble Hornets was kind of the big dog in um, internet horror stuff, there was, it was, you can think about it as kind of similar to what analog horror is, is now. It's like an original project will start that nobody has really kind of seen done in horror before. And then a lot of people will try to kind of come up with their own takes on it or try to expand on it or just kind of make fan works, etc. Like, I feel like that that whole that whole trend kind of died down for quite a few years because that was almost ten years ago, I think. Um, it, it's kind of come back in a like it, it like it comes and goes in waves in a way, and I just think that something like a, a new fresh take on found footage like this is something that is just revolutionary, and I think that I think that a lot of people like myself has been waiting for something like this to come. Enough pieces had been put in place by 2012 that we can actually see the analog horror subgenre take its first steps in a form we could recognize, beginning with VHS. 
The first VHS film and many of its sequels are reminiscent of 90s found footage films like The Last Broadcast and The Blair Witch Project. It's made up of various horror short films that are, in the story, found on VHS tapes and put together as an anthology. VHS was a widespread modern digital film with the analog aesthetic, purposefully chosen to increase the unsettling nature of the footage, a key aspect of the analog horror subgenre's current definition. It's yet another example of analog nostalgia and putting the concept of an analog aesthetic into the public consciousness. And continuing this trend, a year after VHS in 2013, the WNUF Halloween special was released, a film produced in the modern day but set in 1987, with a plot heavily reminiscent of Ghost Watch, where reporters once again investigate a haunted house supposedly live on air during Halloween night before everything goes wrong. Though, the WNUF Halloween special has a far greater focus on 1980s nostalgia. From old cheesy advertisements to 80s pop culture references, it's apparent that this film is a true love letter to the 1980s, looking back on it from a modern perspective, just as some analog horror series are as well. The film as a whole demonstrates the impact Ghostwatch had on the development of analog horror, with its DNA carrying over to some of the earliest projects in the subgenre like the WNUF Halloween special inspiring developments in the analog aesthetic, and continuing to inspire creators and sustain now popular tropes, like the manipulation of a live broadcast. Films weren't the only thing pushing analog horror forward in the early portion of the decade though, and on December 23rd, 2013, a Polish YouTube channel began by the name of Krajnikerzivob TV, or Mushroomland TV in English. Created by Viktor Stribog, the series Parad de Kushmiaku, or Smile Guide, is by all means the first full-length analog horror web series. Smile Guide follows a girl named Agatha as she attempts to make a sort of tutorial, alongside a cast of a few other colorful characters. The content and story of Smile Guide is quite mysterious, bizarre, and at times disturbing and horrifying, and it did lead to quite a bit of success. These mysteries coupled with the fact that I didn't bother to sign my name under this whole thing contributed to the early success by giving people an idea that there was something tangible to be discovered here, that it led to something even though there was never a clear indication of it anywhere. Radnik Ushmiahu surprised people because it didn't seem to try any illicit or any specific reaction from people, which is usually the case with anything. It either wants you to be scared, to laugh, to buy something, to think it's something that it's not. Whatever the motive is, it's usually quite clear. Radnik Ushmiahu just appeared and things happened there. I can't tell you what my motives were creating this project. Every time I answer this question, the answer is different, and every time it's true. But it's not the whole truth, because no one truly knows themselves. It was just something that had to happen, and I had to do it. Smile Guide may not have been made with the intention of being an ARG, or being a horror series at all, but its impact on the analog horror subgenre can be found quite easily, from moments within other web series like CHSS that we'll talk about shortly, or other analog imitations from Poland and the Czech Republic. Smile Guide takes on a format vaguely reminiscent of a 1980s or 1990s children's TV show. It's a format that actually pops up frequently in future analog horror projects, perhaps partially due to this series. Smile Guide also includes an entirely original soundtrack that is incredibly New Age inspired, matching the time period of the series' visuals and serving as another example of a retro nostalgic musical movement around this time. All in all, Kryna Grzyvab TV is a fascinating project, with disturbing visuals, storytelling, and performances, and an analog aesthetic in 2013, which paved the way for the rest of the subgenre going forward. I probably heard the term analog horror when it was going, let's say, mainstream maybe two to three years ago. From the early 2014, when my project was making rounds, it started spawning similar projects, mostly very ARG oriented, and way more than my project was. There were some more visually interesting ones though, first from Poland, then from the Czech Republic. Suddenly there was a music video of a popular artist in Poland made in the same aesthetic as my videos, even with the same similarities in the music. And then more things. I'm not going to take credit for every VHS-inspired thing that happened after that, because it would obviously be ridiculous. I mean, Vaporwave is already a thing when Poradic Ushmiaku came out, although I only learned about it from people commenting on my video. But I'm sure some brand of analog horror video did spring up as a direct consequence of my project, because I saw it as it happened with different creators using my fanbase as a jumpstart for their projects, linking them on KGTV fan forums and groups. I even met some of them in person during meetings. Now were creators of OG analog horror series directly or indirectly inspired my work? I don't know. Maybe it was all of us simultaneously realizing that horror and mystery in the digital age 
is increasingly harder and harder to create, and in order to find that spark again, you need to include it with flawed technology of the past. During this snapshot of time at the end of the 2000s and the first half of the 2010s, Unfiction was reaching new heights via the Slenderverse and other independent projects, while the analog horror subgenre was still being conceptualized, serving as a nearly invisible, still yet to be defined frontier. As Victor just said, many people were thinking about analog technology and how life had changed in the relatively new digital age of the internet. The digital recreation of analog mediums wasn't an idea with a single inciting event, as seen with the rise of vaporwave and other nostalgic uses of analog technology around this time period. However, these recreations were seen as an aesthetic only, or simply as a storytelling device, rather than an entire category of projects. However, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that Smile Guide, alongside VHS, the WNUF Halloween special, and the Wyoming incident, are essential building blocks of the subgenre, which is now made up of tens of thousands of projects, including nine analog horror projects with over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, one of which was Krenogrzyv of TV. This is in stark contrast to the limited grassroot movement we were just discussing, though. So. What was it about these projects, and the concept of analog horror in general, that now appeals to millions of viewers, and appealed to thousands of creators in a way that inspired them to make thousands of their own projects? Especially for the vast majority of fans and creators that weren't even alive for the analog age. It opens up an aspect of mystery that we've all felt for a very long time, and have never been able to properly explore for ourselves, especially for people around the age of the audience now and the age of the creators who are making the content. It kind of reminds me of being in front of like the television as like a kid, like three, four year old playing with toys in front of the television with the old weather channel playing. For people my age, revisiting that feeling of nostalgia and just that, just that foreign feeling of just old, like not ancient, but still old enough technology. There's something about the feeling of that late night 3 a.m. Like just, the, the, I'm having nostalgia of memories that I don't ever recall actually having. There's an inherent mystery in that. There's an inherent mystery in the devices and the technology that was around in childhood that our parents grew up with and told us about that we never really got to actually experience for ourselves because we were children. We weren't allowed to touch it older audiences would um, feel some nostalgia and also the perversion of childhood memories. We were allowed to look at it and wonder about it and then bit by bit it faded. My efforts in pursuing this stuff kind of helps to like recapture, like kind of propagate the spirit of those times out as best as far as I can so that others may have a window into like what that era was like. So there is a nostalgia obviously about it. There's something about like the the nostalgia factor that comes with it. Feel some nostalgia. Point of mystery and nostalgia. I'm having nostalgia. 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 The key driving force behind Analog Horror's viewership and creator appeal appears to be nostalgia. Memories of the analog age, or for younger fans, memories that are vague or blurry or even nostalgia for memories they've never even had. The German word Sehnsucht applies well here, a yearning or longing for alternative experiences, a life or past that doesn't exist, or collective nostalgia, secondhand nostalgia from your culture, or a newer word, anamoya, longing for a past you've never had, a recent word basically created for this exact purpose. Remember, analog horror is not analog, and the idea of nostalgia as a driving force behind analog horror will be hammered in by the events and creators throughout the rest of this documentary. For many creators, like those behind the WNUF Halloween special, analog horror is a nostalgic love letter or tribute to the bygone analog age. However, it's not the only force. As a kid, like I don't, I don't espouse frightening children. Uh, I have one and I don't want him to, you know, experience anything before he's ready for it. But um, I think it's fascinating how the mind tries to make sense of something and give it a space. I think that it, like there's a place to be exploited in terms of uh, a time when you did not understand things as well. And that tends to be childhood. 
I was born in 88, so I still remember vividly all the technology being analog, the frailty of it, how the music recorded onto the audio cassette from radio would slowly but surely degrade with each play, how easy it was to break or lose the signal from a TV or radio in not ideal weather conditions. Don't get me wrong, I owe everything to the digital age and I would never want to go back to the way it was, but there is something that's been lost and it's a certain feeling of mystery and the vastness of the world. When information wasn't so readily available, it carried more gravity. If you heard a song in a random movie or on TV, you might never have found it again. It seems inconvenient, and it was, but also somehow more true to life. This feeling of fleetingness is mostly what I see. I like the idea of analog being this forgotten medium that was useful for a time and has been superseded by digital or, you know, more reliable technology. I think a lot of like radio and, and media like that were f lucky uh, discoveries by science. Um, and we're like, we could use this, this is great. We can actually render a person's voice this way and decode it on the other end. That's cool, let's do that. Let's make a network out of this. I think if I go, I'm allowed to go wide with it, a lot of horror for me is about coming to distrust the um, things that you put a lot of faith in. and a thing where you don't know how you would respond if this uh, structure that you believed and put stock in for your whole life uh, you came to realize that it did not work the way you thought it did and in in discovering that can you go back to uh, believing in it you know because it was easier then but i don't think that you could and what do you do then Younger viewers have been overstimulated by the excess of modern digital media, so videos that resemble VHS tapes or vintage broadcasts are very refreshing. Analog television and technology works well in conveying terror because it leaves so much to the imagination. Its low resolution conveys just enough visual information to disconcert the viewer, while maintaining enough ambiguity to stimulate their imagination. It kind of ties in with like those uh, cryptid videos where you see, oh, it's a furry, fuzzy video of Bigfoot, very low graphical resolution video of a UFO or aliens or whatever. The more resolution you get from uh, from a video like that, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see a scary video saying Bigfoot caught on 1080p. Well, that's not scary. That's just you know a video. It gave me a lot of things to like play around with because if I had like a normal like like modern aesthetic, I just filmed it edited it and then just post it that's it right i tried that before it was boring it, the process was boring you know but once i had like i needed to make it look like an aesthetic then i, I found there was like a challenge there that actually like became fun that's uh it became like a, a process that i was engaged with creators like david cronenberg grew up in the age of analog technology and remember being scared of their television or perhaps seeing the max headroom incident as i suspect the creators of the wyoming incident do those who view it as a way to evoke childhood fear or as a window into a bygone age and even into the ephemeral nature of life itself or beyond that as we just heard some filmmakers and artists feel that it's a unique framework and aesthetic to design new types of stories and play with immersion and expectations it's about the nostalgia of a pre-internet time period, the ominous rough aesthetic, the immersive unique storytelling, and blurry childhood memories. In terms of analog horror and childhood, it's, it's very evocative to me of, uh, again, I come back to the word trust, but it's the idea of when you were a child, um, television is sort of a babysitter, but you assume and maybe kids take that for granted but you assume that it's been vetted in some way that somebody who put this out there knew that i could be watching it as a nine-year-old and um they took care to put the right kind of thing in front of me and occasionally you would run across something as a kid that you're not supposed to see and it would stick with you or it would scare you or at least you didn't understand what it was and that I have examples from my own childhood that that like sit with me and and upset me that you know it wasn't like I saw a scary movie it was more like I don't know what this is on the screen being shown to me and I don't know why I'm being made to see it I don't know like I assumed there were steps before this could get to me but there are none I turn the TV on and eventually I'm going to see something I don't understand and 
depending on how young you are, you may not even be able to express that to an adult and say, what was that that I saw? Why do they do it that way? You know the bumpers at the end of a show, right? And there's a documentary about this called The S from Hell, uh, which is very short and very interesting. But it's about the bumpers that came after um, like syndicated television. Like I Love Lucy, I remember had this big V, this stylized V that used some in-camera effect. So Viacom was the distributor. But it came with a big fanfare and it scared a lot of kids at the time. And the documentary is about these particular people that they found, they're like, I was petrified. I was terrified of this V. I was terrified of the Screen Gems S. And it's just an S, and it's just a loud noise. But as a kid, you don't know why that is there. I just watched a show that I like, and all of a sudden I have to go hide from the thing that I know is going to be startling, and there's a complete mood change from the cartoon I just enjoyed. Why is it there? <laughs> we understand as adults, but... Then it just breathes in a kid's mind as, you know, what does it mean? And does it mean something that I should have to figure out? And, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's unsettling and it just, it's lasting. And I think a lot of video, like being such a, a erratic medium where there's static and tracking issues and things like that, it lends itself to surprises. Some of it requires... Um, in the same way that an inside joke is very funny, but you have to know what the basis is. Um, I think that horror, any type of horror that's very has a specific aesthetic um, that expects you to come in with that knowledge initially is going to require being, you know, it will need a primer for somebody who doesn't is not familiar with that. I, like you said, I'm sure there's like TikTok horror. I'm sure there are super specific mediums where if you understand how this filter works you will be scared but if you don't know then you would not understand what you're looking at and you'd say well i'm just confused the impact of memories and the general concept of the past is clear throughout analog horror from nostalgic reminiscing for the analog age to the terrifying manipulation of its technology We've been talking about all of these mechanisms for a while. Nostalgia, aesthetics, storytelling, and even psychological concepts like the fear of the unknown and childhood memories. And while these still aren't the only important mechanisms, they will be the most important ones as we go forward, as at least one of them is behind each major development in analog horror. On March 7th, 2015, the world was introduced to a new ARG, brimming with quality and new ideas. NOC plus 10. NOC was comprised of various messages from an AI on board the underwater research station Nocturne 10. The videos are usually codes, ciphers, cryptic messages, and other puzzles, with various retro computer effects such as loading screens and text logs, alongside analog effects like glitches and static. Knock is unlike modern analog horror due to its heavy focus on puzzles, but by all other counts, it fits into the subgenre. Knock Plus 10 is a digital recreation of analog mediums, using the aesthetic to enhance the unsettling atmosphere, and as time went on, it became even closer to traditional analog horror formats with its 2020 revival, bringing in new video formats such as instructional videos. With its unique aesthetic choices and buzz within the nonfiction community during its early years, it was more than likely an inspiration to a few more creators later on, and it's a milestone for the analog horror subgenre, with it being the first web series or project so far that fits in aesthetically with modern analog horror, as Kreiner Gajivab TV is quite stylistically unique despite its membership in the subgenre. Previously, Marble Hornets found a place within analog horror's history thanks to its few analog traits and its impact on the unfiction landscape overall. However, the 2015 Marble Hornets spin-off project, Clear Lakes 44, created by the Troy Has a Camera group, fully embraced the analog traits of its predecessor. 
Alongside a new live broadcast inspired format, it is indisputably part of the analog horror subgenre, complete with plenty of glitches and VHS effects, and even starting several common subgenre tropes, like the focus on broadcasting stations and using VHS glitching or static to abruptly cut off various scenes. If you want to really look at series, <laughs> again, we, we bring up Marble Hornets, we bring up Troy Has a Camera as a group who were responsible for the first forays into really using analog technology as a central focus of creative projects dealing with horror. Their attempt at Clear Lakes 44, what that was shaping up to, did seem to be the approach they were initially taking. No, nobody knows really what that could have become, but it seems that anything Troy Wagner has done creatively has had roots in analog horror and using analog technology. What I will say is that Clear Lakes 44 did seem to have an impact. It did seem to stir in people the idea of, hey, you know, old technology and old TV broadcasting can be really kind of creepy because it was right after that that we had what I consider the true first dedicated analog horror series, CHSS. And CHSS was partially inspired by what Troy Wagner did Clear Lakes 44 uploaded their first video on August 3rd, 2015 on the Marble Hornets channel. Though when the series was cancelled in early 2016, the videos were unlisted from the Marble Hornets channel, and only re-uploaded on a separate account. Clear Lakes tells the story of a station broadcasting videos of Birdwatcher, a man dealing with strange occurrences and a creature named Walker stalking him. The story is told through surveillance camera style footage in a way that feels reminiscent of paranormal activity alongside footage filmed literally through the eyes of the characters, through unknown but canonical means. It's honestly a bizarre, difficult to understand plot that essentially goes nowhere due to its untimely cancellation, and while it does have a heavy emphasis on the ARG and found footage elements, it does firmly lie in the realm of analog horror. Clear Lakes 44 still uses the analog and live broadcast format as a framing device, which was something new for online nonfiction as broadcast horror had not been seen in full-length web series thus far. It, alongside the other Marble Hornets spin-off, Ekva, brought the analog aesthetic and analog horror into the unfiction public consciousness even further, and helped to further the genre along and give it more legitimacy. A mere nine days after the premiere of Clear Lakes 44, on August 12, 2015, came the premiere of Cave of Shadows, an analog horror web series that takes the idea of a half-hour segment of broadcast television and runs with it. While cryptic side videos and ARG puzzles are interspersed, the full-length broadcasts are dedicated to an attempt at digitally recreating analog media and a live TV format. A now deleted second channel from this series, Awake, even features a stereotypical VHS font and uncanny valley faces. Cave of Shadows and the Awake series look more stylistically similar to the modern subgenre than any other analog horror project we've covered so far, and these stylistic choices actually spread thanks to the attention the series got from YouTube creators. However, they were often viewed in a negative light due to their lower level of quality, and its impact was small compared to the upcoming introduction of the biggest name in analog horror. Local 58 initially was, I wanted to do something with this idea of, uh, the moon being malevolent for some reason or carrying some weight like an inscrutable unknowable i'm not even going to say intelligence but just there was something wrong with it and um i wanted to do something with that uh not as a story um and i and the idea of like emergency alert system and the that broadcast noise uh, is frightening. It's something that it demands your attention. It's time to talk about the elephant in the room, the godfather of analog horror, Local 58, created by Chris Straub. Local 58 is an anthology web series and another example of broadcast horror, with a loose plot based around the moon being a Lovecraftian entity, but with mostly self-contained episodes imitating a local analog TV station with broadcast interruptions, PSAs, children's shows, and more. 
It's commonly thought of as the founder of analog horror, and while it clearly isn't the first project of its type, it was still among the first in the subgenre, and was the series responsible for its popularization, as well as the widespread nature of its formats and styles, like emergency alerts. However, it took some time to actually have this impact. Local 58's massively popular YouTube channel began on October 31st, 2017, but the series began two years prior, on October 26th, 2015, and it had other history even before that, with a Channel 58 being referenced in Straub's 2009 immersive short story, Candle Cove, a story which actually carries many themes and ideas that would be prevalent to analog horror. I feel like Candle Cove is absolutely something that could show up on Local 58 that you'd have to as a viewer confront and come to terms with maybe and having done candle cove and also having sold the rights for it um and not being able to do more with it not that i thought there was more to do with it i think that was it was what else could be done with it it's best with as little detail as possible but um i wanted to be able to evoke that sense in an audience still but really, I only did it, I did the first one, Weather Service, without intent of making more. I thought, I got it out of my system, I'm done. And I was doing a channel with my friend, uh, uh, Chainsaw Suit Original, which was like, it was a comic I've been do I had been doing for like a decade. And um, we did a podcast around it and we're like let's do video stuff for it too so that was what that channel was i uploaded that video at night uh like at midnight i'd finished it in a fugue state i did it in like over across 20 hours and i was like okay so i'm done and he's like i saw it uploading i didn't know what it was you didn't tell me you were going to do it it was very upsetting <laughs> to, to, to find it um but it did uh it did real well it was received well and um i did two more on that channel uh and then it lay fallow for a while uh before i thought well it could be its own thing like and it's also very disjoint from the content that also was on the channel so i was like no it should be its own thing the first episode weather service released on october 26 2015 the second, Contingency, on January 16th, 2016, and the third, You Are On The Fastest Available Route, on June 19th, 2016. A website called Local58.info existed to host and promote these early videos, but this early history has now faded away. The site is offline, and Chainsaw Suit Originals was later renamed to FilmJoy. After Fastest Route in June 2016, Local 58 went on hiatus for over a year before being reborn on its own channel. But these first three episodes planted many seeds for the expanded analog horror subgenre, and created the formula that most projects imitated until around 2021, with this formula essentially being a live TV broadcast that starts off seemingly innocent or normal, before taking a turn for the horrific in the middle and going back to normal at the end, often with heavy static, TV broadcast hijackings, emergency alerts, and a degraded tape aesthetic. That's tough because for for local 58 at least and maybe this also speaks to the the uh you know relatively small amount of them that it were that i've released yet um but i didn't really want to go back to the same well and i think that that's it's hard it's very hard not to do uh the structure of normal broadcast enjoy break in it's outside your house you know ominous confusing message back to normal broadcast, nice time, then break, like, they've always been among us, like, so I wanted it to cohere, I wanted it to make sense, like, if it's going to be, if this broadcast is going to be broken into, then who would want to convey that? I think it's a cool device to deploy once in a while, um, but I knew that I could go, I could hit that um, emergency broadcast sound over and over again, and it's a scare every time, but I also think it loses energy at that point. I wanted it to have certain moments in it uh, that toyed with analog um, in general. Somebody had uploaded a, a, it's still up there, I think his name was Christopher Huppertz, 
but he had uploaded for free use uh like an hour and a half of vhs like glitches and bad tape and you know whatever and moments that were like backgrounds too that had just you know the the impression of a of a beach at sunset or the impression of a you know a shape uh something that was on the video that was was glitched um but i had a lot of fun looking in through that for scenes that would inform some of the horror some of the moments and probably my favorite sort of uh, serendipitous discovery was uh in weather service there's sort of seems to be two voices one is don't look at the moon and the other one is you can go out and look at the moon why don't you look at it um but when the when the video gets brought, uh, broken into by the voice of reason that appears and says don't go outside don't look in the window don't look in a mirror in case there's the moonlight is in it uh the very first frame there is a sort of abstract background that was from that vhs tape and uh, I think it had black here and red here. So when I typed in black, do not look at the moon, it, it says, you can't read do not, and it says, look at the moon. And then that person realizes in horror what I do not want. That's the opposite of what I said. So they have to highlight and change the color of the, of the Chiron so that it is now legible. Uh, and there are a lot of things in doing local 58 that i don't think i would have have thought of or been able to like storyboard until i sit down with the with the the public domain stuff and just sift through it and and find things in it that's like this would be good to alter in this way you know sometimes in editing them there's a moment in that that is sufficiently good to change the course of the episode and make it like, no, this is better. This is stronger than what I was going to do. These original Local 58 videos, and mainly the very first one, Weather Service, were so unique and pioneering. The media formats and even the story themes that appear within this original trio have been proliferated throughout most of analog horror. Of course, Weather Service features two entities fighting for control over the emergency weather warning feature on the Local 58 station, with frequent broadcast interruptions, static, and hints towards an extremely powerful, mysterious, Lovecraftian entity, which in Local 58's case, is the moon. These ideas served as the basis for a lot of analog horror, and while fictional emergency alert videos had been around for some time, they were limited in scope and Local 58 was seemingly the first to transform the concept into a horror short film, pushing it in a more mainstream direction and causing many more people to make their own. There were, at the time when I started Local 58, I know that there were stations, or there absolutely were um, people who would upload recordings of uh, broadcast events, emergencies or whatever, or like, um, you know, fans of uh, air raid sirens, like where they 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 record the sound in their town just so like this is what it sounds like and i liked a lot of that stuff but i wanted it to go a little bit further meanwhile the second video contingency ditches the cosmic horror aspect and goes in a more grounded direction serving as the basis for yet another set of formulas and ideas used by some later creators it takes the concept of a disturbing or corrupted government PSA and is basically one of the most terrifying videos to ever grace the internet, with the US government ordering citizens to kill themselves and others in order to win a final victory over invaders. I think that having a vague source of danger or horror, um, I think just on its face, by definition, it you the mind goes to, well, is it a god? Is it a Lovecraftian, unknowable entity that's doing this um just by keeping it vague uh i don't i mean i think that we leap there anyway guarantee like there's absolutely ways to not go there right uh in um for example the second local 58 which was just about um the government says we lost so maybe just go outside and kill yourself and that's we'll show them if we all get on board with this plan we'll show them which is such a terrible idea, um, but there's no 
interference from other powers there you know that's just a that's just an awful idea that enough people got on board with uh that they were able to turn it into a law i guess uh and you don't need uh you don't need monsters to do that like we can do that we're good at that too and finally, You Are On The Fastest Available Route plays with the idea of the horrors of corrupted technology, with a found footage format and the concept of a corrupted GPS system guiding a driver deeper into the forest, until his destination arrives to him first. But beyond just the surface level themes and structure, Local 58 also set the first person viewing perspective as the default for analog horror. That feeling of you as the viewer, watching TV at night and seeing these horrific things. It's one step further into immersion than even most found footage, unfiction, and previous analog horror, because those have characters, and while it attempts to make you think it's real, it's still not a situation where you are the one participating. By being a viewer of it, I don't want there to be a main character, I don't want there to be an intercessor figure that's experiencing this, I want you to be the person experiencing this, I want, I want you to feel like you're watching TV late at night and then the broadcast is interrupted and then now this is your problem as the viewer. It is not the problem of a character in the show and when they, whatever befalls them happens, you can be like, wow, that was tense. It, but it's not, it's fake, it's fiction. I just watched it happen. I want it to follow you out. I want it to linger when you stop watching. You're the main character. Uh, and I think that found footage is similar because in watching it, you know, in a way you become the discoverer of it. And, you know, I remember I watched the, the Blair Witch Project for the first time. Uh, it was out in theaters, but, and the ad campaign was very effective in trying to make you think like, we found it and we're going to show it. But I didn't see it in the theaters. My friend had gotten a, a VCD of it. He got a bootleg of it. But I watched it with him and a couple other people in a dorm uh, on a laptop. And I think that was way more effective than if I had seen it in a theater. Because I felt like, you know, it's almost like he found it. I found this footage in the woods and let's watch it. Uh, and up until, you know, the credits roll and let you know that this is a piece of fiction. Like, I, it was sold. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was informed so much by not just how good the movie was, but also how we saw it, how the, like, the arena in which we saw it. But that, I think that, yeah, analog horror that looks back is trying to, um, I think it's effective when it's trying to evoke that, um, that sense of paralysis, paralysis or powerlessness that you might feel when this, uh, series of events becomes yours to deal with somehow instead of just something you can suspend and turn off. Local 58 was a trailblazer for the entire analog horror subgenre we know today in many, many ways. The theme, structure, style, and formats, the first person view. For years, it would all be defined by Local 58. And as we discussed earlier, this all stemmed from the analog age, from nostalgia, and from childhood memories. You know, the, the origin of these was uh, uh, KLCS Channel 58 in Los Angeles, which is actually not in Los Angeles proper, where I'm from. It was in like the high desert. It's like Palmdale or something. That, and that's the channel that showed me a lot of stuff as a kid that I came to understand later. Uh, but it, is a, it was a fascinating thing to have discovered. A lot of what they showed, like you could not, you wouldn't get to see Sesame Street there. You wouldn't get to see any of the public broadcast fair on Channel 58. You would see um, film strips from like the 70s and like um, educational shows from Canada. But I can point at the specifically um, the show on Channel 58 the actual Channel 58, that uh, sort of spurred a lot of this in me as a kid. And somebody has uploaded them to YouTube also. So if you want to go look for, it was a show called uh, Inside Out. 
The following is from a national instructional television series. The series and related materials were developed and supported by 32 educational agencies with additional support from Exxon Corporation. To the best of my knowledge, it was a, a series of educational film strips that I think was designed for a Canadian school system classroom. And its function was about 10, 15 minute vignettes. Its function was to show the student a moral quandary and then end on a moment where the teacher would turn the, the projector off and now lead a discussion with the class about what they had seen. And in that context, it makes sense as something you would watch at home by yourself with nobody to contextualize it for you. All I saw was a disjoint event that was happening to a kid and was never resolved. Come on, come on, light, light. Oh no, it went out. I don't have any more matches left. What do I do? Oh well, who needs a fire anyway? It was all. It would always end on something like, "He fell in. The, he fell in the river. He's gonna drown. He's gonna drown." And then they go freeze frame. And then they push in. It's just film. It's a film effect. It's not video. And then they go to credits. And you just linger. You don't get to find out what happened because nothing happened. It's supposed to be, that's the teacher's job now. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that played on that channel. And it was not fun, but I could not look away as a 10, 11 year old. It's like, I wanted to see it. And uh, there, it wasn't meant to be understood by the single viewer. And, which is incredible that it would even make it to air. Nobody was deciding, you know what, should we run these? Because it seems like it's designed to lead a classroom discussion. No. Nope. So it just showed up in our house and uh, it stuck with me. And, and if I can evoke that in people, then, I, then I've succeeded. After all of that, even though the pieces were in place, like the formula, the format, and the themes of analog horror, it would still be another two years before they were widely adopted, and Local 58 became the godfather of the subgenre. In that interim period, several other analog horror projects would take the spotlight, continuing to develop the subgenre. So my name is, well, I call myself Turkey Lenin III, and my main project was uh, CHSS in 2016. CHSS began on January 16th, 2016. It's a series with a strange, foreboding, vague, and sometimes surreal tone, containing psychological surveys, bizarre drug commercials, special messages, and ominous voiceovers. When I blimped, I I saw, I saw someone in the corner of my eyes. Not even including the ARG attached to the series as well. The reason why I had like participation in CHSS is because every other series, well, most of every other series I've seen, for example, the Slender series like Marble Hornets, Everyman Hybrid, all those ones, they did have interaction. They had some fan interactions. So it made it seem that this thing is happening in real life. It's not like separated by the fourth wall. CHSS has like a story center present. I wanted that story so I can make a viewer connection. Nowadays, I see a lot of analog horror is more like you see what you see. You don't really have any say in what's happening. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's bad. It's very focused. Sometimes like the interaction also doesn't suit the story itself. So I think that's also another good, it's a good choice. It's, it's a choice. It's just a choice. The analog videos of CHSS play into this ARG with hidden messages or bits of lore that explain the mystery of the series. A story of secret experiments, monsters, and broadcasts from CHSS being re-uploaded in the modern day. It's called a tragedy. It's a tragedy story, right? It's a, it's a monster tale, right? It's a Cold War thriller, but it's mostly a tragedy because it involves two sides, the protagonist and the antagonist. 
at odds of each other, not by their own fault, but by the fault of their masters. You know what I mean? My human character uh, used to be part of the CHSS program. It's not his fault. He was just employed there. This creature I had, the Katya or Atlas, she had no choice in being becoming the monster. She was just a slave to her masters, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy of circumstance, basically. I wanted to tell some story, Soviet versus the United States, like an um, espionage story. Uh, furthermore, you know, like uh, MK Ultra, the CIA project, uh, all those weird fringe um, projects. You can see what CHSS was. It was an arms race between two nations. A creature sent over to do like electronic espionage, um, psychological espionage, and a project in order to combat it. It's basically a Cold War thriller. It's basically one of those like Cold War's uh, Tom Clancy novels or whatever. My one was taking place in two timelines. One that flowed during the 1980s, the backstory, and also another present day interaction that was the main story arc. CHSS was a milestone in the analog horror subgenre, because even with these two parallel timelines, it was the first project outside of the still obscure Local 58 that was more focused on being an analog horror series than a present day ARG, with its emphasis on the 1980s era videos. Many of the earlier analog horror projects we've talked about are all clearly present day stories, with their use of the analog aesthetic being mostly for, well, aesthetic reasons. Something supplemental to the ARG elements, and the plot of the videos, not a core part of the project. However, CHSS uses the analog aesthetic meaningfully, and in a way far more alike to the rest of the analog horror subgenre than the earlier 2012-2015 projects. The analog like aesthetic was not like a genre, but just a sub tool for anyone trying to make a web series. So there was no like clearly fine like because he has VHS elements in it, it's a analog horror. It's just oh he has VHS elements in it, cool. It's a VHS aesthetic themed web series. To expand on the story, I wanted to tell it in the period of the 1980s to 90s. So first off, I needed to make it so that obviously you wouldn't have 1080p or 1440p on like videos from the 80s, right? You, you had to set it with analog horror and VHS. The story I wanted to tell required analog aesthetic to entrench it in reality. The extra multimedia content in CHSS's ARG was required to understand the complete overarching plot, but the videos themselves stand alone as a project and a story. CHSS was a successful series, and further exposed the unfiction community to the analog aesthetic, and ways that the aesthetic and idea of broadcast horror could be used to create suspense, tension, and horror. And today, in recognition of these contributions, CHSS is often given the inaccurate but honorary title of the first analog horror series. I have no idea why people call it the first analog, but I, I don't mind the title. I would say, actually, honestly speaking, the title I think I would give myself was kind of like the bridge between the old web series and the new analog horror because mine had the features of both. I had a running series of uh, main characters, main like story arcs, main like um, antagonists. Then I have the horror aesthetic, all that stuff, all the normalcy under uh, under the normalcy. There's a level of a sinister dealings, you know. At the time, CHSS was nothing ground groundbreaking to me. I was just making another web series, just contributing my little part. Analog horror was well into development in 2016, especially now with CHSS and its focus on manipulating non-found footage broadcast television formats for horror in a 1980s setting. It was a massive step, but not the only important horror project with an analog era setting that year. In July of 2016, one horror project took the world by storm and kickstarted a massive wave of 1980s nostalgia in the United States. Netflix's Stranger Things. It's well documented that this series created a wave of nostalgia for the 80s and generated a massive amount of interest in the time period, even in teenagers that weren't alive for that time. And as we've covered, nostalgia for the analog age, especially in young fans, is a key reason that analog horror has risen to success. There's no way to quantifiably measure the impact the series had on analog horror. However, it may not be a coincidence that analog horror began finding increased success only after this period. And moreover, it's incredibly likely that there's an overlap in fans of different modern created 1980s based horror media. Stranger Things created a demand for more 80s based horror projects, and it's a demand that analog horror very well could have filled.
For now, let's get back on track with the third project in the Marble Hornets franchise, Ekva. After several puzzles and teases establishing the end of its predecessor Clear Lakes 44 and setting up a new broadcast station, Ekvanet, the project made its YouTube debut on October 13th, 2016. The analog aesthetic is used in many ways during this series, from station IDs to advertisements for drugs or jobs to live broadcast interruptions to an unfinished children's show known only as Alice Pastry. Ekva takes on an even rougher, more unfinished version of the analog aesthetic than most analog horror projects, with the text, graphic design, and actions of the station fitting that of an unsteady, partially collapsed organization. But this is what makes Ekva unique, while still fitting in perfectly alongside Local 58, CHSS, and future broadcast horror projects. The broadcasts we see in the videos are mostly a form of reruns from when ECFA was a fully functioning station, and they're being recorded and uploaded to YouTube by an observer, specifically our main character, Hawkins. The modern day story serves as a narrative framework for where these broadcasts originate from. CHSS is formatted very similarly, and in fact CHSS and ECFA are incredibly reminiscent of each other which does, in a way, make the dual modern day and past timelines emblematic of the 2016 era of analog horror. The subgenre was evolving quickly, moving from a series of unconnected projects with the analog aesthetic to a well-defined broadcast horror format in only four years. Live TV broadcasts and a modern day or ARG narrative framework were the defining characteristics of analog horror projects at this time. And while broadcast horror would remain the dominant type of analog horror for many more years, analog horror ARGs did fade away following ECFA and CHSS, as non ARG analog horror web series became dominant in the space. Though this wouldn't be permanent. While CHSS and ECFA were still ongoing, 2017 served as the calm before the storm, with no major developments in the subgenre until Halloween night, October 31st, 2017, when Local 58 ended its hiatus, finding new life on YouTube. And with the first new video, Station ID, on November 2nd, 2017, Local 58 claimed the title Analog Horror for the first time, formalizing the new subgenre and creating the term that would soon be used by millions of people. I'm not sure if the term analog horror existed before I put it on the trailer for Local 58. Well, I wanted a way to describe the um, horror, uh, like these short films, in terms of like what kind of content could somebody expect. Like, I think I looked a lot on um, YouTube and, and other uh, sites where people are doing horror shorts, but they could take any form, and largely they are actual short films with actors and camera crews and all that and those are anywhere from you know five minutes to half hour would be considered a horror short but I was only interested in delivering something that used these very basic uh, visuals rather than like I, sh I need to have a main character I need to have dialogue I need to have uh, um, all the trappings of what everybody thinks a short film is with this formalizing of the subgenre, Local 58 provided the template for the analog horror web series, which would soon cause the decline in analog horror ARGs. Over the course of 2017 and 2018, Local 58 gained traction across the internet, from Reddit posts to reaction videos on YouTube, including a few from semi high profile creators like Etika. There were even a few videos imitating the unsettling emergency alerts from Local 58's weather warning, such as these by Million Fowl in 2016 and early 2017. But despite the fact that Local 58 was in place and that it was successful and well received, it wasn't the widespread juggernaut we know today. There was no large scale internet dominance, and really no recognition of the analog horror subgenre. Local 58 did not yet have the success it would know later on and it was relegated to being in a small corner of the internet with essentially a cult following, not yet the father of a subgenre. I had no uh, big plans for Local 58. It was just gonna be the one video, but I liked, and I liked doing it. Um, but if that had been it, then that would have been it. I wouldn't have been super disappointed because I did the thing and I did what I wanted it to do. I just wanted to express that one conceit, that one moment. As long as you look at like it being successful or widespread, like what is the actual definition of success? If Local 58 had only been the one episode that came out, 
I would have felt like it was a, a success because I did it to the way that I, I wanted it to look and, and be. And uh, it would be okay if only a couple people thought that that worked, you know. That would be fine. Local 58 was now out in the open. It was well made, well received, and it worked. Obviously, because it sparked an entire subgenre later on. But for right now, well, the subgenre was still ripe for new creators. There were many viewers in Local 58's first year, and at least one of those viewers was inspired enough to make their own series. On June 29th, 2018, the first project by creator Aiden Sheik began. Channel 7. Channel 7 was heavily inspired by Local 58, even being dubbed the first Local 58 clone by some, with an unprecedented number of emergency alerts and similar TV programs and formats to Local 58, Ekva, and Awake. Despite this, it was still watched and beloved by thousands of fans in a short time, as Local 58 was. The demand for more content like Local 58 with the same amount of polish was there, and though it was viewed in a less positive light, Channel 7 delivered, filling this void with rapidly produced, well-edited content. Channel 7 benefited from being the only new analog horror project at the time, outside of rare one-offs like the WLCB TV special presentation video. It succeeded in part because of this, but more importantly, it forged the path for future creators to succeed in the genre. He showed that using Local 58's formula, even as a teenager with a limited budget, was possible. And that's a takeaway that is key to the analog horror subgenre, just as it was to the Slenderverse and Creepypastas. However, this takeaway wasn't only important in a general sense. It would be applied much more directly very soon. And by very soon, I mean on August 8th, 2018, when popular unfiction and horror commentator Nexpo published his YouTube video discussing Local 58. How's it going? Uh, my name is Ryan. I run the channel Nexpo. Um, I like to cover a lot of uh, internet mysteries, uh, disappearances. I touch on true crime, um, but I mainly like to uh, dig into unfiction, uh, ARGs, analog horror, all of that. It's a big passion of mine. I remember I was living in Colorado. It was late, late uh, 2017, and I was just, you know, going through YouTube one night. Then I saw one of their videos, and I. I was just fascinated, but I didn't, at that time, I didn't know how to formulate any sort of story with it. I thought it was just like, you know, like a couple one-off videos that were really spooky and cool. And I was like, man, this is awesome. And then that was it for like the discovery of Local 58. And then I'd say about a year later, uh, throughout 2018, when I started putting out, I guess there's a show for children. And I think he put out like a channel trailer or something. Um, that's when I went through it again. And uh, I was like, man, this, there's something here. I was like, man, I can make a video about this. Like, I, I haven't seen, like, aside from, like, Crane at Gorgie Buff TV and Smile Guide, like, any, like, actual analog horror series like this. So, yeah, I went with it. I feel like that series, like, it, it deservingly needed to be shown. And I, I just wanted to, you know, broadcast it to people and share it with my audience. And... I feel like a lot of people resonated with it and, it and it led to, I guess, ideas flooding in for the next wave that would eventually come. Nexpo opened Pandora's box, and it was time for the inevitable part of every genre's life cycle, clones. As an example of this phenomenon, when the video game Doom came out in 1993 and enjoyed immense success, it was followed by hundreds of so-called Doom clones, to the point where any first-person shooter game was just classified as a Doom clone. However, Doom clones eventually evolved into what we know as the full-fledged FPS genre, and, well, we're not calling FPS games Doom clones anymore. This isn't an isolated incident, though. Ripoffs, lookalikes, and other projects taking heavy inspiration from the leader of a genre are very common. Even within the unfiction field, it happened with the Blair Witch Project and found footage, it happened with Marble Hornets and the Slenderverse, and it happened with the Sun Vanished and Twitter ARGs. Local 58 and Analog Horror would be no different. 
Directly after the Nexpo video, Local58 began gaining attention rapidly, with wider social media attention and smaller creators discussing Local58 because of Nexpo exposing it to the public. After this point, Local58 began gaining almost 10,000 subscribers per month, while Emergency Alert and other broadcast horror short films copying Local58 began appearing at a rapid pace for the first time, giving credit to Local58 and sometimes even to Channel 7 for their inspiration. In the months directly following the Nexpo video, beginning around September 2018, these clones began popping up constantly. Channel 11, Channel 495, Local 64, just to name a few. Almost all clones, with many giving credit to the two main non-ARG analog horror series that came before. It's, it's interesting you brought that up because I completely forgot about that phase of things. <laughs> the the post-Local 58 pre-analog horror blow-up um, where there were a lot of one-offs. There were, I remember coming across a ton of channels in my recommended that were just one video and it was like local 58 and there, I had fun going through those and I actually wonder how they're doing, but there, yeah, there were a ton of them. The local 58 clones contributed to the growth of the analog horror community, regardless of their quality. They're an important step within any subgenre, and while they are largely unoriginal, some of these clones would go on to have unique characteristics, or would go on to either turn into something more unique, or give their creator enough experience to make a second project that is more unique. I mean, you can't not do a broadcast interruption. You can't not use static. You can't not, you know, there are a lot of stuff that are that's ingrained in the medium in this particular analog horror needs these devices and these tropes to function. I know that a lot of new creators are thinking about how do I, how do I differentiate what I'm doing? How do I not rip off? How do I not um, just copy? And I think you start with a copy and then you figure out what your voice is inside of that and what, it, and that's what will be unique about it. I think that is the, that was the core is like, what, that's what differentiates it too, when people are worried about how will I make mine stand out? Will you tell a, talk about what scares you? Like a lot of this stuff started as something, as an idea that scared me if I looked at the moon or, you know, what if my GPS was giving me instructions that didn't, that were now increasingly incorrect, seemed like, uh, it starts from there. Like that's the seed of it. Analog Horror is a collaborative online storytelling space. Like Creepypasta and like the Slenderverse, it's a place for new creators to be supported by a formula and take their first steps as a creator. Local 58's massive growth starting in August 2018 is what spread its formula around the internet and led to many of these creators taking their first steps. And that growth was largely caused by Ryan and his coverage on the Nexpo channel. Nexpo was a catalyst for Analog Horror's current existence. Without that video in August 2018, Analog Horror would not exist in the form we know it as today. It's weird, you know, running a YouTube channel, because I'm just a dude in a room. Like, it's weird when you hear things like, you have impacted people in this way, and it just doesn't feel real, honestly. It doesn't. Like, I, I, I just, I feel like if I just took myself out of the equation, like, things would just still be as they are. And I guess when you tell me things like this, it, it does kind of, you know, open my eyes a little bit. Like, certain things have impact. And I, I feel honored, I guess. I feel very honored that, that I have, I've been able to share uh, this amazing medium with people and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future because there are so many cool things that can come from this. Thanks to Nexpo, the subgenre was experiencing its first boom, and by this point, it was now a recognized genre. From here, it would only get bigger. Local 58 hit 100,000 total subscribers in June 2019, just in time for another YouTube channel even bigger than Nexpo called Film Theory to discuss Local 58 on June 15th, 2019, giving the series even more attention, with 50,000 new subscribers in June alone. This is where Analog Horror, and Local 58 specifically, was really starting to take off. I think I noticed when, uh, People cared enough about Local 58 to make memes about it. 
that I would discover it in places where I had not been, you know, where there was stuff about looking at the moon or the fastest route and seeing other people spreading it and, um, and getting excited about it, uh, and wanting to make things around it, I think, yeah. So seeing fan art or memes about it, it was such a, uh, it's a good barometer for uh, whether or not an audience cares, is engaged. The Local 58 clones were in full swing, but beyond that, with the foundation set by early analog horror ARGs, the moderately successful Channel 7, and now the surge in Local 58's popularity, there was a new generation of creators aware of the genre and aesthetic, ready to try it for themselves. Not as clones, but as unique creators in their own right. And this is what we'll see in the latter half of 2019 onwards, a massive explosion in the amount of projects and videos in the analog horror subgenre, leading all the way to the modern day, taking over unfiction, and dominating the entire internet. talking about analog horror. There are so many questions, so many moving parts, and so many concepts to cover. They're almost all still left to wrap up, and I'm going to. But on a fundamental level, the one thing we're trying to answer and explore above everything else is, how did we get here? The history of analog horror. And when it comes to that, nothing is more crucial than the last piece of our timeline a period I'll be calling the Analog Takeover. With the, uh, I guess, Analog Takeover that's been going on lately, I am happy to see it. What made me realize that things are really taking off uh, came 2019, 2020-ish, when here and there I just find you know, more and more projects just popping up. And especially through the pandemic, a lot of new ones started coming to light and stuff and like uh, like Baddington the Walt Files all those guys like just started coming up everywhere and I'm like oh my gosh this is awesome and then Mandela catalog comes along and just shoots to the top and I'm like okay analog horror is big <laughs> like what's going on the analog takeover is not an exact event it's more of a movement or a process that started in 2019 and mainly occurred throughout 2020 and 2021. And as we go through it, it'll wrap up a lot of these loose ends and lingering questions. So let's just start with the first project in this period. Analog Archives on June 5th, 2019. The second analog horror series by Channel 7's creator, Aiden Sheik. The subgenre was evolving, and so was this creator, now moving in more of an anthology direction, focusing on multiple different stories simultaneously, with more videodrome-esque harmful broadcast signals and strange supernatural occurrences. The series was very popular and well-liked, with a similar structure, level of polish, and path to success as Aiden's previous series, Channel 7. However, at this point, Local 58's dominance was still all-consuming, and analog archives utilized few new formats, focusing on TV broadcasts, emergency alerts, advertisements, and security camera footage, while also including ARG elements with lore in the video descriptions and an in-character Twitter account. But what makes this series important is that Analog Archives is a transitional project between what I'll refer to as Analog Horror Gen 1 and Analog Horror Gen 2. This is yet another concept borrowed once again from the Slenderverse, because Analog Horror's parallels to it remain incredibly relevant. 
Now, Analog Horror Gen 1 was defined almost entirely by the television broadcast format, usually with ARG elements, which basically includes everything we've covered so far. Analog Archives often fits in with those design principles. Most videos are broadcast horror. However, it also has some unique ideas and key links to Analog Horror Gen 2. It was the last major project to take on the common traits of the previous era of analog horror, and it acts both as the end of the old, broadcast horror, but also as the beginning of the new, with its use of the medium of VHS tapes, like instructional videos or found footage, which are so-called Gen 1 used rarely, if ever. Analog Archives does appear to be one of the first projects to take a step into this medium, and it would be key to Gen 2. However, it was still heavily linked to Local 58 and other projects of that period, carrying traits like broadcast horror and ARG elements, rather than fully embracing VHS tapes and Gen 2's other traits that we'll discuss soon. The most notable unique idea from Analog Archives came in its ending on July 12th, 2020, in the form of a fictional 5th generation or Nintendo 64 generation video game called Summer 64. It wasn't the first analog horror video of this type, but this is part of a larger topic that I want to touch on later. But what it showed was that Aiden Schick was transitioning into Gen 2 of analog horror over the course of Analog Archive's development, rather than sticking solely with the preconceived ideas of Gen 1. With Local 58's influence being magnified in the end of 2018 by its growing success and clones spreading across the internet, it would be likely for the subgenre going forward to be completely defined by broadcast horror. And it was on the small scale level of clones of Local 58. However, to the filmmakers out there with the skill and creativity to make a majorly successful project, Local 58 exposed them more so to the idea of analog horror and its use of the analog aesthetic not just broadcast horror, and those ideas translated into a new interpretation and idea of what analog horror is. I've seen creators finally get away from using the same old concept of public access television, and that's why I, I say Local 58 must have been the hardcore originator of people recognizing that as a term and a style because what is local 58 it's the story of a public access tv channel you know it's the relics of whatever was shown on that channel for that local station and again we look at clear lakes 44 which was largely doing the same thing we look at ECFA, uh which rose from the ashes which was doing the same thing we look at CHSS, which was doing the same thing. You have a whole lot of people in the beginning who were all about this public access kind of idea, and people are finally getting away from that, and they're realizing, okay, we could use aspects of that, but we don't have to be completely reliant on it. It's actually the technology itself that's pretty damn creepy, if you think about it. One of the things that Mandela Catalog has done very well is Alex Kister has recognized you can have media that was shown on TV, but you can just as easily have analog horror and tapes that were created and then doled out to people for specific things. You can have personal recordings of things like police departments, fire departments, emergency teams, little bits of collective media from characters in the story. So there's the awareness now that Okay, while I love public access as a concept, and while people love public access as a concept, I am not limited to this. It's actually well beyond that, and I've been ignoring, as a creator, um, what the wider field of media can be in terms of analog tech and the horror that can be told with that kind of analog tech. While Analog Horror's Gen 1 was defined pretty clearly by broadcast horror or live TV and the common use of ARG elements, Gen 2 is a little more murky. So much of it is experimental and unique from one another, but the so-called Gen 2 is mainly defined by its nearly exclusive use of VHS tapes, often using actual characters within the videos with a distinct lack of ARG elements and out-of-video story. And in fact, videos in this period usually utilize immersion-breaking elements like credits, 
And those are something that Chris Straub had pioneered and normalized in this subgenre with Local 58 due to one of his previous projects, Candle Cove. Candle Cove looks like a forum thread and got absorbed, uh, I think creepypasta.com, which existed around that time, took it and posted it there. I didn't have a problem with it. It's just that I just wanted my name on it. I was like, it's okay, like just link back. But uh, it got shared to a lot of places as though it was an actual forum thread. And as an artist, I think that's super cool and good. But as a business person or as an owner of intellectual property, I was like, no, like just leave my name on it. That's link back to it. Don't take all of the stuff off and then say, I found this. I was on the website. My friend screen capped it and now you could see it's real. That was my issue with it. I mean, no, it's less special to have a name on there. I, I understand that, but especially if it's scary and it's supposed to be ephemeral and it's supposed to be uh, discovered, that it can harm the thing. Like, do I spoil Candle Cove by getting it copyrighted? Where you could look it up in the Library of Congress or in the Writers Guild, that it's a property. It's like, well, that's not real then. That's okay if it's not real at that point. Yeah. I didn't want to have that experience again. The topic of credits in analog horror, thanks to Local 58, is actually a very important topic. Not only to analog horror, but to unfiction as a whole. For a long time, immersion breaking has been incredibly discouraged in unfiction. This is not a game used to be the golden rule for all of creation. Everything was real. But with this new generation of analog horror forming in the wake of Local 58, a softer attitude towards immersion-breaking elements would be widely adopted, even to the point of channels being named after their creators, rather than the in-universe series. But of course, this opened up questions as to analog horror's place in the unfiction community. But really, it's just an evolution, both in analog horror from Gen 1 to Gen 2, and in unfiction as a whole. So at the beginning, um, the the immersion breaking elements kind of did throw me off a little bit. Um, and I think I, I do have a feeling that that Chris Straub, you know, adding his information at the end of his videos kind of inspired everyone else to add their name at the end of their videos too. Some people on the first episode were like, well, I liked it right until the credits came up and the credits broke. It. Now I don't now I know it's a falsehood. Now I know that it was a fiction. Yes, it's a fiction, and it's allowed to be a fiction. If you just if you look past it, it's it doesn't bother me personally anymore. I do feel like it it does have a place in the unfiction uh, community. It's not about putting it on TV for your grandparents and making them think there's a nuclear strike. I think that sucks. I think that is irresponsible. <laughs> Things can be scary, and also you you know that they're not real. That's okay. There's a part of me that did not like, at the end of every Monument Mythos video, seeing the name Alex Kisanis popping up, a film by Alex Kisanis, because it's like, I, I really don't like that just that full-faced stamp at the end. But at the same time, I had to ask myself, but does it diminish the storytelling? And the answer is firmly no. It does not diminish the storytelling. It does not diminish the overall experience while you're in it. For example, Monument Mythos, very famous. A lot of his stuff is, is presented in documentary form. Never explains who is a documenter, you know? A lot of like subtitling, a lot of like um, thumps, cuts, all that stuff. Where's the footage coming from? No one's explaining it. I find that it doesn't jar me at all, not knowing where it's coming from. It's just, um, it's just Alex, he's um, telling a story and he's telling it really well. It's more of like, okay, here's my channel. The channel's called Alex Kister. Here's just my, here's a series that I made rather than the channel being called the Mandela Catalog as it used to be. I just like being interactive with my audience, I would say. When, whenever I look up to series that I really like, I, I mostly really, I also really enjoy their creator or studio or whatever. So I kind of want to emulate that feeling that I have with other things that I like. The genie's out of the bottle now. There's no putting it back. The, we've had so many Alexes come in here and kick down the door and say, hi, I'm Alex, and, and, and stick their hand out. 
and, and that you know what there's there's no there's no putting this genie back in the bottle you and your entire club fuck this up buddy <laughs> but you know at the same time no you didn't because because the feeling of wanting to be seen for the work that you put in and the artist that you are will always be there when you pour all your efforts and time into a certain project and just for the sake of being obscure and spooky you can't credit yourself for all your work i feel like that's kind of an unfair battle to fight or make an, an unfair hill to climb to be considered unfiction so that i think with like creators coming out and stuff there i i encourage it honestly when you look at things like Mandela Catalog and Alex Kansas's channel and see all these creators who are very publicly owning their work and acknowledging the fictional nature of it while still keeping up an air of play along and a reality through whatever site they're using or platform they're using to present the media, it does still feel like unfiction. And I'm not so hard-nosed now on the idea of you must stay in the shadows as an author. Because nobody ever, nobody ever really does for long. Eventually, the author is known either by accident or by their own decision. We're just at the first point in the history of it where they are being extremely open about it and i think that's okay i really think that is more than okay everything we're talking about in this documentary is related to change it's related to history it's related to evolution like going from gen 1 to gen 2. it's all about the timeline of analog horror and its impact on the internet mainly within Unfiction, which it is definitively a part of, but also within other internet communities. And our evolution continues from the community formed around Five Nights at Freddy's, a popular video game franchise that began in 2014, which has had a massive impact on internet horror in the Unfiction space and beyond. In the franchise, you typically play as a night security guard, defending yourself from Chuck E. Cheese-like animatronics through security cameras. On the surface, this is a very simple premise, but due to the deep story, lore, secrets, and puzzles, the franchise has continued to grow. The games are actually set in the 1980s, with staticky VHS-like security cameras and Atari-esque minigames, already linking it to analog horror and to video game-based analog horror, which, again, is something important to remember. However, this becomes more relevant with our first real entry into Gen 2, on July 25th, 2019, from YouTube creator Squimpus McGrimpus and their fan-made Five Nights at Freddy's VHS tape web series, consisting of employee training tapes, security footage, cartoons, and a few other formats. These are all elements seen or referenced in the franchise's games, with things such as instructional phone calls, hidden 8-bit games, references to cartoons based around the animatronics, and plenty of other media and 80s iconography. However, the fan-made series took it to another level, using the lore and design of the games to create a story and dive deeper into the world of the games, while making the analog aspects of Five Nights at Freddy's fully fleshed out, bringing them to the format of YouTube analog horror, complete with rough visual qualities, uncanny valley faces, text-to-speech voices and voice acting, and more. Some of these traits are common within Gen 1 of analog horror, but some of these traits are also ones that would become popular in the future with Gen 2 of analog horror, partially due to the innovation of this series. With the combination of Five Nights at Freddy's name brand recognition, alongside the web series production quality and unique media formats, during a period when analog horror was still a relatively non-competitive subgenre, this series took off. Over the next several years, it led to many other Five Nights at Freddy's VHS tape videos that basically became a subgenre of the subgenre in their own right, most notably those by Battington in December 2019. And the FNAF VHS concept also went on to inspire other future series, like the massively successful and influential Walton Files in 2020. 
This first Five Nights at Freddy's VHS series set an example for many analog horror creators, and was an important stepping stone into the new generation, as new experimental projects began to spring up more and more. One such series, called the Minerva Alliance, began on August 26, 2019. Another anthology series, with a slight twist. My name is Forks and Rec. Um, I was the uh, former lead on the Minerva Alliance project, and I'm also currently in charge of the Tapes from the Dark Side project. Back when it was running, it was basically just like, in terms of on the actual production end, it was, it was an opportunity for like people who didn't necessarily want to like have their own whole separate like series, but still want to make something, and the opportunity to make that with like the guidance of the rest of the people on the project. The Minerva Alliance was an analog horror project made up of multiple collaborators, led by Quarks and Rec. There are several interesting things about this project, not only that enough people were interested in making analog horror that a team like this could actually be put together, but also that the anthology format and collaborative nature actually had a story-based justification. And most of all, the concept of multiple collaborators led to innovation. It's collaborative in the sense that like if someone else has an idea and they're working on it and they need like help with an audio, video, voice acting stuff, like we would be able to provide that for them. So we essentially basically like mesh that with like the actual story element by having like all these basically like SCP like agent code names and they basically like do like the archiving. Most theories, at least at the time, were like well all local fifty-eight inspired and like you can kinda like tell with the broadcast kind of like look and stuff, but like I liked analog archives approach like actually like, video cassettes that were pre-recorded material. So at the time, that was a relatively unique thing to focus on. So that was kind of, the direction was inspired by that. And I was one to be like one of those pioneers of voice acting as well, because when you look at an old TV broadcast, you'll notice that like there's not just text on a screen the whole time. And I wanted to capture as much of that kind of like what TV would have actually have been like at the time. So I was aspiring to be like one of those that promote like the use of voice acting or at least like text-to-speech stuff. The Minerva Alliance was a definitive part of the new wave of analog horror, a project that saw Local 58 and other ideas done before, and had its own take on it, from voice acting and text-to-speech to something a little more experimental and non-conforming. Uploading audio logs by a story character named Tommy Parsons, which were fully voice acted and set in the analog age thanks to its audio effects and sound design. I'm going to get off. I need to think about things. Audio logs were a unique format that brought the character element into the Minerva Alliance, and characters were becoming incredibly common and key to analog horror in this generation. While audio-based analog horror was and still is rare, it runs deep in the DNA of the subgenre, starting all the way back with War of the Worlds in 1938. The Minerva Alliance is one of the few modern projects to attempt to continue that lineage in any way. After the popularization of the subgenre in 2018, and the influx of Local 58 clones in the following months, innovation began flowing into the subgenre once again in mid to late 2019, with the Minerva Alliance, the FNAF series, and the next project in our timeline, a turning point was reached, and our Gen 1 of analog horror was firmly over. Gemini Home Entertainment began on November 17th, 2019. It's an innovative, unique, terrifying, high quality, and overall impressive analog horror project. From found footage elements and CGI scenes to the dedicated VHS format and focused story, creator Remy Abode managed to produce terrifying moments and show horrific concepts beyond the capabilities of most low-budget indie creators. Abode began his work in analog horror at least a month prior with a one-off video titled Warding 12, but over the next year, Gemini Home Entertainment would become incredibly successful, and one of the few projects considered by the community at the time to be a worthy successor to Local 58. Unlike most other analog horror at the time, Gemini wasn't an anthology series. It tells one story through the analog horror videos and the very limited ARG-like elements outside of YouTube, which include lore images on Discord and a playable video game. All of these aspects contribute to the tale of a shape-shifting, skinwalker-like alien species called Woodcrawlers, a Lovecraftian entity known as the Iris, a mutated version of the planet Neptune, and the effect of all of this on the world. 
Since it was so early in the new era of analog horror, Gemini Home Entertainment was still operating to some extent by the rules and expectations imposed by the past two years of Local 58's popularity. However, this was a necessary stepping stone, because what Gemini did paved a path forward. In a sense, it gave the typical analog horror formula a facelift, improving what already existed like the Lovecraftian Entity's glitchy rough aesthetic, formula of going from normal to terrifying to normal, or the typical analog horror goal of subverting expectations. But it also built on this formula by showing horror imagery rather than telling the audience, making longer, more suspenseful videos rather than quick short films, and having more quality and production value than its contemporaries. If Gen 1 wasn't already over, Gemini Home Entertainment was the final nail in the coffin, as it firmly set the VHS format as the new default for analog horror, and was now the template for analog horror clone projects for the time being, mostly replacing Local 58. With this replacement, Gemini cemented its place in analog horror history, and rose to success thanks to its many moments of horror brilliance, unique monster designs, interesting scenarios and scenes, as well as its new formats, like the cave footage from Advanced Mining Vehicle, or the completely original and fully playable Lethal Omen, an imitation of a 1990s low-poly, or fifth generation, video game, which, once again, we'll talk about later on. But Gemini was a shining beacon of light in a subgenre still finding its footsteps, stepping out of the shadow of Local 58 and demonstrating what else was possible with analog horror, inspiring many more projects later on, and being an important milestone in the growth of the subgenre. The new era was in full swing, and just like that, we have to talk once again about Aiden Sheik and his third analog horror web series, Eventide Media Center, which began on February 15th, 2020. It was, once again, an anthology, with an underlying narrative that could be decoded given enough time and effort, similar to Local 58. The series demonstrates further improvement in polish and visual creativity, as Aiden has demonstrated with each new series, and brings in new concepts and experimentation, like the heavy use of 3D models, which began with the FNAF VHS series. However, the video formats themselves, such as TV broadcasts and VHS recordings, vary little from what was seen in previous series by Sheik himself, or in the heavy hitters of the genre, like Local 58 and Gemini Home Entertainment. However, Eventide grounds itself much more deeply in the VHS aesthetic, and takes on a longer form video format, largely as a result of the trend Gemini Home Entertainment popularized. More than anything else, Eventide Media Center and Aiden's history with analog horror serve as an interesting case study. His projects reflect exactly how the subgenre has developed over time, as various aesthetic choices, formulas, and trends came to the forefront or faded away. Channel 7 began in the age of broadcast horror, or Gen 1, and took its inspiration from Local 58, Ekva, and Awake. Analog archives picked up where Local 58 and Channel 7 left off, and still largely clung to that era, but had begun to shift into the VHS or Gen 2 era of analog horror, operating in a brief transitional period as analog horror became more defined and understood, expanding beyond the simple concept of TV broadcasts. And finally, Aiden continued reflecting the subgenre's evolution with Eventide Media Center, demonstrating the adoption of VHS, impact of Gemini Home Entertainment, use of 3D models, and increased increased formula experimentation. Through his three series alone, you can watch analog horror grow and evolve from a limited concept to a full-fledged evolving subgenre. And analog horror was heavily evolving right around this point, of course due to factors we've already talked about, but also due to a large worldwide event coming up in our timeline, the COVID-19 pandemic. While stuck inside in 2020, with analog horror already on the rise, many new people discovered it for the first time, and many decided to try making their own. The pandemic offered a large boost to analog horror, and while some of it was natural viewership growth, the viewership rise after this point is due to far deeper reasons. Since analog horror often carries themes of media and technology being harmful, as well as the concept of global crisis and government alert systems, analog horror began speaking to people more at this point in time. In the midst of a real global crisis, where we were using technology and hearing far more from our governments than ever before. However, a far more concrete, definitive reason for this boost, especially among unfiction creators, was that analog horror is accessible. It's a foot in the door, a shared online storytelling format, and it's a gateway into unfiction, film, 
and other types of creation. I think analog horror maybe inspires people because there seems like there's a low barrier of entry. Like everybody has access to, you know, iMovie is on your phone. You don't need all of this big fancy equipment to make an analog horror series. And I mean, I, I kind of found that myself through just exploring a bunch of different apps and stuff. Anyone can make analog horror with little to no video editing experience and anyone can watch it online. There's no requirement for actors. You can literally just use text and pictures, that's it. It's just it's just graphics on a screen and I just need a, like a text to crawl across and I need to be able to cut between things and, and that's it. It can be a solo project, like my one was a solo project and it was done at no cost at all. Because it's so accessible, it opens up production from a lot of younger people, a lot of people who really want to want to tell a story and they decide, hey, let's just use analog horror. I can appreciate the fact that a lot of smaller series are going out of their way to make something. Like, especially with some of the ones that I don't necessarily enjoy from a technical standpoint, a lot of them seem to have really good premises for their story. And I think that that's really all what all these people are. It's just people with a good story in mind and are just looking for a way to tell it. Basically, what I that's basically the same way that I was when I started out. That's also another reason why CHS is analog horror, because it was so accessible to me as a solo creator living without any friends who have the same interests, without any like money. I was a kid, I was 16, no, no, no tech. I just used a computer the whole time. So me back then was basically every single other kid right now going to analog horror. But analog horror does have certain aspects of it that um, would be easier to, I guess, learn the ropes with. So it seems approachable. It seems like uh, anybody can come in and try, at least try, if not succeed, but to attempt. It's a staircase. Nobody, nobody ever takes a flying leap at the stairs. Some people go up two or three at a time. The really bold ones, they'll jump it three at a time or, you know, those who are a little bit more trepidatious but have some confidence will take it two at a time. Everybody else, they'll take it one step at a time. And that is perfectly fine. As long as you get on your path, you know, and try your best to be original, try your best to be unique, and put your own spin on something, then it doesn't matter if you're starting out with something where the two tools that you're using are Photoshop and Premiere Pro so I think that it, I think it's a cool place for anybody to just start and play, because that's all anybody's really doing at the beginning. It's like I'm interested in this. How do I play in this space? Analog horror technically required no actors and no outside locations. All you needed was an editing software. Chris Straub made Local 58 with iMovie. Turkey Lennon the Third made CHSS with no budget and nothing outside of some editing software. Alex Kister made the Mandela catalog on his phone. I mean, hell, right now I could go on my phone, download a free editing software, and throw together an analog horror-esque video in like five minutes. It wouldn't be good, but it would be a video nonetheless. A piece of unfiction. Or, by definition, a short film. And that is a foot in the door. That is a first step. It's a concept that's been prevalent through analog horror's history already, but this concept was the key to what made analog horror so appealing to creators during the pandemic. A time period where we were all locked inside. No access to actors or locations, just watching YouTube, seeing the other successful analog horror projects, and deciding to make our own, getting that foot in the door. By the end of 2020 and during 2021, the analog takeover would be in full effect, with the success of Local 58, Gemini Home Entertainment, and soon, The Walton Files. Analog horror went from a popular concept to the dominant form of unfiction, and by 2022, thanks to other series coming up at our timeline like the Mandela Catalog in the Backrooms, it had essentially become a monopoly, and grew bigger than any unfiction ever had before. Because even after pandemic restrictions loosened, the snowball effect had already begun. More people making analog horror meant more people discovering analog horror, leading to even more people making analog horror, and it just goes on. On one hand, this was a good thing, with such a large influx in new creators joining the unfiction community. But on the other hand, analog horror was becoming oversaturated. Thousands upon thousands of projects being watched, created, posted, and spread online, boosted to success by everyone locked inside in 2020. And by 2021, it had become too big to die. And this was the analog takeover.
Well, when you start getting memes on YouTube from channels saying this is basically analog horror, which, by the way, from, from a historical perspective, in all the time I've been doing this, I have never seen mainstream audience memes based on niche creative projects like these. There were... <laughs> Slenderman had memes, but Slenderman was an altogether known idea. To actually have an entire subgenre and branch of what unfiction is and internet storytelling producing memes that are getting shared around and making the kind of numbers that are indicative of mainstream audiences recognizing it and having a laugh, that is very significant. I have seen the, I guess, meme videos about analog horror, like the analog horror be like, and it's some silly, you know, thing. Um, so I have seen those. It comes with everything, you know, at every, I feel like every genre at some point, you know, gets, gets memed. It's a good thing, but it also completely supports the point that you just raised, which is <laughs> if people are saying that there's oversaturation and a little bit too much imitation, yes, there is. The memes are the evidence. <laughs> The memes are the evidence. Go ahead, write that on a wall, as silly as it seems. But memes are a great indicator of where people's thinking and feelings are. Anything that, that is popular is going to have people that don't like it. And I, to be honest, with, with uh, certain series that do, like the spooky faces and the emergency alerts, there's nothing wrong with it. Honestly, I don't think. But there is a way to make it stand out and be unique. Analog horror is also, or the internet in general, because this is where this arises. It's an interesting medium because you get to see the learning process of every creator presented as if it's finished. Um, there are a lot of people making analog horror now that are maybe like 13 years old and they're just cutting their teeth on it. And But it's not going into like a notebook that they don't show anybody. They're they put it out there. The very apparent presence of analog horror on YouTube right now and just the internet as a whole is like, it's, don't get me wrong, it's really cool and good to see. But at the same time, there's, there's a lot of drawbacks and specifically with mostly on the internet, if something becomes popular, it's doomed to become oversaturated. And I think that it's definitely in its early stages of becoming that right now. Okay, just look at like the Slenderverse. Back in 2013 to 2015, back then, every single web series was a Slenderverse, like Slenderman series, right? And you see how that's kind of gone. It's kind of died down a bit after a huge spike in popularity in the like the early 2010s. I think analog horror is following that same trend. Obviously, when something gets popular, people they just want to join in. They want to bandwagon it, and obviously, a lot of the content that's being created around analog horror, the majority is going to be subpar. Not bad, subpar. There's going to be a few outstanding ones that make people go into it, right? I definitely kind of got a little nervous when I started seeing like more and more uh, like people because obviously like with a lot of something really popular, you'll have some certain persons that I, I, I guess that like contribute negatively to the community. So I definitely was a little bit like nervous when I first like saw uh, sort of the popularity of the genre like rise a little bit. <laughs> Okay, that's funny because it's, it, it reminds you of like economics class with like a, a what's it called, a perfect competition and uh, long run equilibriums and whatever. Then when there's like a huge market that's making profit, when there's more people joining the market, it's gonna turn down the profits to zero. You know. I think that right now, it's in a generally mainstream kind of area, but I I do think that because of how popular it's gone and how many series has popped up as a result, people are really going to judge the big ones in comparison to those. Analog horror was well on its way to becoming the multi-million viewer juggernaut we know it as today, and it was in the final stages of this rise as the pandemic occurred. However, despite the rising success, the amount of large-scale influential projects still remained relatively small. As we discussed, most analog horror projects were small-scale series made by new creators. There were still a very limited number of widespread evolutionary projects, and those are what we'll be focusing on.
The next one of these evolutionary projects began on April 26, 2020, with the first video of The Walton Files, a Five Nights at Freddy's inspired analog horror series. But unlike the previous FNAF web series we've discussed, The Walton Files has its own unique story and assets, not reusing any plot points, characters, clips, images, or audio from the franchise it was inspired by. This degree of separation allowed The Walton Files to go in a more unique direction than the previous FNAF analog horror attempts, without being hindered by previous lore or established aesthetics and formats. The Walton Files uses found footage, cartoons, animated 3D segments, voiceovers, traditional instructional VHS tape segments, and once again, fictional video games. That's really something I'm going to talk about soon, but The Walton Files use these elements to tell its story in videos that can be anywhere from 10 to 60 minutes long, which is quite rare and impressive for the subgenre. The Walton Files demonstrates a willingness to break the rules and formulas established by Local 58 and the rest of Gen 1 even further. The Walton Files has full-fledged characters, unique animated video and found footage segments, uses acting and voiceovers, and much more, which does somewhat harken back to the early age of analog horror, but stylistically and structurally, it looks towards the future of the subgenre, and carries the non-conforming VHS and character-based format of Gen 2. In essence, its creator Martin Wall was telling a story on their own terms, rather than on the terms of the existing analog horror subgenre. This type of attitude from major creators was prominent over the next few years, as new formats and storytelling tools were used, and the subgenre became more varied. By this point, for those major creators, the phase of Local 58 being a god of the subgenre was firmly over, and there were so many new things to explore in the analog horror format. And to demonstrate that, Let's explore that idea I keep alluding to. Video games, and fifth generation gaming horror to be exact. A totally unique format of the subgenre that had been previously explored, but was about to grow even more thanks to the popularity of traditional analog horror. On June 4th, 2020, YouTube creator Greenio uploaded a video simply titled Tape One. This was the beginning of an analog horror series based on the game Super Mario 64, with videos containing VHS footage of what is essentially a horrific, modded, or corrupted version of the game. It honed in on that sense of nostalgia and the corruption of it that analog horror is known so well for, and the series became very successful because of it. However, Greenio's project wasn't exactly unique. The haunted or corrupted video game trope had been done many times before, and this trope had even been used in concert with Super Mario 64 by other creators in the past. But it remains important because there is a major chapter of analog horror's history that is yet to be explored, and Greenio's Super Mario 64 series is one of the largest and most important pieces of this unexplored chapter. We've already talked about some video game analog horror, the Walton Files features VHS videos of a fictional 8-bit video game, belonging to the third generation of video game consoles, like the Atari 2600. Greenio's Mario 64 series, the Summer 64 video from Analog Archives, and the Lethal Omen video from Gemini Home Entertainment feature VHS videos with fictional 5th generation video games, referring to the Nintendo 64 and PS1 consoles in the 1990s. While video games are actually digital media, these specific videos are, without debate, considered analog horror, because the early generations of gaming are heavily associated with analog technology. Their lifespan took place during the analog era, and most importantly, these early digital video games were still a firmly analog experience, because they were viewed and played on an analog CRT TV display. Because of this strange relationship, people often overlook the immense number of other unfiction videos and web series centered around early generation gaming that could be considered part of the analog horror subgenre, but aren't because they're standalone and not part of a previously existing analog horror series. The idea of a living, corrupted, or otherwise dangerous and malevolent video game is quite common. Films like War Games, The Last Starfighter, and Tron all carry this concept. The Polybius urban legend began somewhere near the early 2000s, telling the tale of a 1981 arcade cabinet supposedly run by the government as a psychology experiment. 
In unfiction, stories like this popped up over time on forums and as creepypastas, before making their way into proper ARGs, as we saw with Ben Drowned in September 2010, one of the most famous unfiction projects and creepypastas ever. In Ben Drowned, a user named Jaduzable acquires a cartridge of the game Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, playing it and uploading footage to the internet. The cartridge still has the save data of another player named Ben, and over time, the game is clearly seen to be haunted by this previous player, with it becoming corrupted and terrifying as Ben seeks to escape the game. It holds the same concept and design choices as Greenio's Super Mario 64 series, but it wasn't ever classified as analog horror. The same goes for 2017's Pets Cop, which is presented as footage of a PlayStation game that gets stranger as it goes on, in a style similar to the game seen in the Walton Files or Analog Archives. And the Crow 64 ARG, which began in October 2020, has videos of a supposed lost 90s PlayStation game, the same as Greenio series. These are just a few of the most important entries in this chapter, and while they may not have an obvious VHS overlay, they have a place in the subgenre's history. With Greenio's Mario 64 series being recognized by the community as an analog horror series, these other projects can be as well. I want to say no. I really want to say no, but I also don't feel like I can, because it is so reliant on the era of analog tech and the decade and the time. See, analog, analog horror is kind of, it's a sticky situation with the definition because it feels kind of nebulous. It leans one way or the other. It's either lying on the side of it must be reliant on the technology or it is lying on the side of it is from the time period of the technology. So as long as it's from the time period and utilizing technology from that time period and it looks clearly dated then it's analog horror because it's looking at the era these early generation gaming projects carry the same traits as traditional analog horror the modern recreation of an analog era format a blurry roughly produced aesthetic glitchiness and static and a heavy emphasis on creating a sense of nostalgia it's just a little different just like how broadcast horror and VHS horror are a little different. And while these video game-based analog horror projects evolved independently from traditional analog horror web series, they did definitively converge with Analog Archives, Gemini Home Entertainment, and Greenio's Super Mario 64 series. With those projects, early generation gaming horror became one with traditional analog horror, and traditional analog horror became one with early generation gaming horror. The influence of early projects like Ben Drowned and Petscop can clearly be seen in the Walton Files, Analog Archives, Gemini Home Entertainment, and Greenio series, and as such, play an important part in the subgenre's history that cannot be ignored. Let's move back to our main timeline. August 26th, 2020, when one of Analog Horror's biggest projects and creators began, Alex Kansas and the Monument Mythos series. The Monument Mythos is about an alternate history where the world is simultaneously more idyllic and hellish than ours, as though two ends of the spectrum have collapsed into a singular timeline. I believe that the Monument Mythos is successful because it taps into fears which many Americans have, fears that we've always had. In this alternate reality, national landmarks are home to eldritch horrors. The Monument Mythos videos commonly take the form of documentaries about this alternate history, usually with a VHS-based analog format. However, the Monument Mythos stands out in many ways, by leaning partially into the digital age, by incorporating animation into some of these short films, and by having full-fledged voice acting in many videos. I have a speech. And it has the thoughts and that you people expect to hear. These decisions in regard to the medium are entirely in service of the emotions I wish to convey with the installment. Every episode is about a feeling. Its structure reflects that. I very much enjoy hearing my characters come to life, and I enjoy the process of working with voice actors. Hearing President James Dean is so much more entertaining than reading. I never went out of my way to intentionally create videos which would be classified as analog horror. The classification is the unintended result of my experiments in no-budget filmmaking. 
In fact, I wasn't aware of the genre until I was a few films into the mythos. The Monument Mythos is not exclusively an analog horror web series. Rather, it uses both analog and digital mediums to convey the necessary information. The Monument Mythos is another example of the basic concepts and ideas of analog horror being turned into something new, with its high production value and quality evolving the subgenre in its own ways. It continues the experimentation of the new generation of analog horror, and once again carries the new generation traits of VHS tapes and the overt use of characters. And beyond that, it does incorporate something else that will be quite important for the future. Digital formats. It stands out as a carefully crafted series that fully utilizes the potential of its analog formats, and its impact is obvious through the ideas of creators today. By the end of 2020, the subgenre was fully developed and expanding rapidly, with new formats and ideas. Thanks to coverage from YouTube creators, it was growing and spreading at an exponential rate, with no signs of stopping. This was around when I started my own analog horror based on fiction project, Walker Creek, on October 23rd, 2020, which eventually led to this very documentary being created, and it even has its own documentary on my channel if you want to learn more. But even beyond unfiction, the game Control had the absolutely fantastic and terrifying analog horror Threshold Kid lore videos in August 2019. Marvel Studios' WandaVision in January 2021 would digitally recreate analog sitcom formats with elements of horror, the manipulation of a live broadcast concept, and other analog horror traits. Little Nightmares 2 would soon have creepy analog televisions as its main plotline in February 2021. Even YouTube creator Brian David Gilbert was getting in on analog horror, with his own incredible take on it in March 2021. And those are just a few easy examples. There are dozens more. Mainstream, highly popular projects right around this time period that are analog horror or share traits with the analog horror subgenre, potentially leading fans of said mainstream creations to seek out other similar projects, like the analog horror web series we've been discussing in this documentary, once again, boosting the size of the fanbase. With this much attention, 2021 would be a time for the proper analog horror subgenre to explode out of control. Many of the analog horror projects of 2019 and 2020 were about to be recognized and made famous, and with more small-scale clones of popular analog horror projects being made than ever before, experimentation was necessary in order to stand out. For the most part, only the truly experimental projects were able to find widespread acclaim and success from this point on. Las Vegas, Nevada, February 18th, 2021. A new project captured the attention of many unfiction and analog horror fans. The opening of Meow Wolf's Omega Mart was an immersive art exhibit located in Las Vegas, taking the form of a strange grocery store with hidden secrets. Of specific interest is the viral YouTube marketing campaign for Omega Mart, which began on January 28, 2021. The marketing videos take on the format of seemingly innocuous advertisements with the analog aesthetic. Over the following year, this video and similar ones, as well as the entire concept of Omega Mart, went viral, spreading like wildfire across unfiction communities and far outside of it onto Twitter, TikTok, and other social media platforms. Several more advertisements, as well as employee training tapes, would be uploaded over the rest of 2021, falling into the analog horror subgenre and bringing in new viewers. And due to these being produced by a company rather than an independent creator, the production value and quality was unlike anything seen in the analog horror subgenre before, with full casts and acting, sets, highly detailed props, and more, making it a truly impressive project, and one that expands far beyond the limits of typical YouTube analog horror. While Omega Mart was taking analog horror in a brand new direction, Blue Channel Thalassin was taking it back to basics on February 6th, 2021. Made by YouTube creator Gooseworks, it's only one video, not a series. And yet, it was still able to grow to massive success and have a large impact on the subgenre. The video imitates a TV drug commercial, and uses the appearance of altered faces from deep within the uncanny valley for horror. 
The use of Uncanny Valley faces for analog horror began all the way back in the Wyoming incident and was used often in other Gen 1 projects, but it had fallen into disuse by this point. However, Blue Channel Thalassin arguably kicked off a trend, a resurgence in this Uncanny Valley jump scare style horror that would only be intensified by the next major development in the subgenre. I am Alex Chister, and I created the Mandela Catalog web series on YouTube. The story of the Mandela Catalog is a story about a bunch of human characters that go through an uprising of alternates in 1992, which are uh, demonic, malevolent beings that use very unconventional ways to um, take advantage of humans in order to take their place. And I, and I like to use more of uh, psychological tactics more than just, oh, they kill you and then they just take your place. I like I like to think that they use more of a like a metaphysical take on it in a way. On June 9th, 2021, the first video of the Mandela Catalog by Alex Kister was uploaded. An experimental, fresh, and interesting series that would soon become one of the most influential projects in analog horror history. The series invokes horror on multiple unique levels, through the use of religious imagery and the concept of alternates, shape-shifting entities that have invaded Mandela County often portrayed through the use of Uncanny Valley faces. The Mandela Catalog is an incredibly high quality project, one with deep roots that span the entire history of analog horror, coupled with a well-written story and carefully crafted suspense. And one of the key aspects that allow it to be so interesting and fresh is that the alternates can infiltrate media, including TV broadcasts and VHS tapes. This DNA runs all the way back to the genre's influences, like Videodrome and The Ring. But in the case of the Mandela Catalog, these alternates can alter VHS footage, and have access to recordings or footage that wouldn't normally make sense in the context of the story. In this sense, things like audio recordings of conversations can be seamlessly integrated with real 1980s cartoon footage, text-to-speech or real voiceovers, found footage, advertisements and PSAs, security camera footage, documents, and far more, while still feeling immersive and unique due to its editing and presentation. There's things that you imagine that you're viewing late at night on a TV or something like that, but there's also things where you are seeing found footage from a character as they're experiencing something. So you can kind of put yourself in their shoes as well. But also, you can see things going on that involve the characters, but aren't from a first person perspective, where it's more of a third person type thing. Like, for example, like the phone calls in volume two and one. And I just think that I think that that combination just kind of works really nicely in analog horror. I like to utilize a lot of pre existing media. Um, and recontextualize it. And a lot of that media is already well known, like the few criminal sketch drawings that I've used. I knew that, like, I was always scared of those as a kid, the ones that I used in the series. And I really wanted to kind of hone into that just primal fear that those give off, along with using nostalgic stuff like the old biblical cartoons. If it's played through an analog device, that's, it means that it's, it was previously made a physical copy of something instead of something digital these days where it's like we don't really know it's hard to understand what goes on behind the scenes with all the coding and stuff but when you look at a vhs tape you see that it is there like you can hold it and just to see that being messed with in ways that we just don't really understand that that is particularly creepy to me i would say the mandela catalog is an unprecedented example of the growing popularity of analog horror while prior series had taken years to garner any attention or success the mandela catalog was picked up quickly by youtube creators and social media users in a snowball effect as more and more people became aware and wanted to get attention for covering it therefore exposing it to more people and well as i said causing a snowball effect similarly to what happened with local 58. The Mandela Catalog's coverage birthed the new generation of clones and imitators, and the largest batch of new creators being inspired to join Unfiction so far. The explosion of Volume 1, I think that really might have done something, because I've seen a lot of other, other series kind of taking some influence from that as well. 
it became the most dominant and influential project in the subgenre so far, and Alex Kister himself was reaping the rewards of this success and the overall growth in analog horror. Around a year ago now, I was doing my music department audition um, for the college I was at. And if I, if I would have told myself a year ago, oh yeah, by the way, in a year, you're going to be a almost half a million subscriber uh, YouTuber, by the way. And I just, I, I, well, obviously I wouldn't believe myself. When I started college this last fall, I was majoring in music performance. So that was what all of my time and time and energy was going into at the time. But then once things started to pick up, especially when I, I remember the only, the only video I uploaded when I was in college was metaphysical awareness disorder, which was probably the easiest one to make and also probably the shortest video I've made. So the fact that I just made that and I just remember it just going up and up and up and just the subscribers just kept going up too. Um, and it was getting to the point where um, I can make money off of it with Patreon. And I'll always, I'll always remember my, my first um, notification for my first patron during <laughs> drumline rehearsal. Um, and just thinking like, geez, like I kind of had an epiphany. I was just thinking like, I wonder where this could take me. Like, where, where am I going to be in like a year? Like if this keeps growing and little did I know that in October, mid October, I've decided that in combination with just how much I just didn't really think college was for me. Um, and also just the the crazy growth that the series has gotten, I decided to uh, drop out and just completely focus on the series as my main source of income, which has been very, um, that has worked in my favor, I would say. This success wasn't entirely positive though. With the Mandela catalog, the analog takeover was complete and the subgenre had cemented itself as the dominant subgenre in unfiction, even up until today with the release of this documentary. Whether this is a positive or negative thing depends on how much you enjoy analog horror, but for the people who didn't enjoy it, this was a negative event. And as hate for the Mandela catalog piled in from that portion of the unfiction community, criticisms and infighting grew regarding formulas, uncanny valley scares, and the impact the Mandela catalog had on unfiction, with all of this having a large effect on the unfiction and analog horror communities at large, and on Alex. To be honest, I would say that I actually agree with most of the criticisms of analog horror. And there's an insane amount of stuff that I just wish I could go back and change about what I've done with the series. I have legitimately lost sleep due to stress because of how I made something maybe almost a year ago. And now it has almost 4 million views. And now I just wish, like, I at the time, I never would have expected it, ever. That was the last thing I ever would have expected to come out of it. Um, so to, to see that kind of thing blow up and then to be criticized is I, I I am not opposed to I and like I agree with most of it and it does it does kind of hurt to see how how people respond to that kind of stuff because it, I mean it makes me feel kind of guilty especially since I've seen a lot of comments I've seen a lot of people say that I was the reason why analog car is has become um, what it has now in a, in a negative way the first few months um, especially October through December of 2021 were, were, was a time that I was in a really, really strange mindset. Um, having this huge surge in subscribers, um, in such a short amount of time was, was extremely polarizing for me. And especially since that's when I was starting college too. Um, that was a, that, like this combination of things was just really, really strange, really weird. And it just, it was just a really surreal feeling for the longest time. That was such a hard thing to get over. And especially towards the end of the year, it started to get really, it, it was, it was a really negative experience. Like I was in a terrible mental state, especially with all the criticism that I was receiving, just knowing that I couldn't, I, I can't really go back and fix the things that I made when I was 17 anymore on my phone. <laughs> but as I said before, it's just one of those things where I mean, it, it just happened. I can't really, I can't really do anything about it. But the only thing that I can do right now is just improve, and just show. And I just want to be able to show people what my potential really is. When the new year came around, I sort of 
gotten used to it, I guess. I, I'm, I'm like kind of accustomed to how it feels now, and I'm able to deal with things like battles in my own head a lot easier. Um, like I'm able to accept things. All of the mistakes that I've made and all the stuff that's happened um, is just another reason to motivate me to uh, keep improving what I what I make uh, with every upload, but also kind of expand my horizons of what the series could be and not just limited to like scary face and camera for 10 seconds or like news alert system type thing. Like I really want to make something that is something that can be seen as something on its own rather than clumped together in these in this mess of other things. Despite this criticism, the Mandela catalog made a name for itself, rising to the top and becoming beloved by many. It did this first by gaining traction through more traditional unfiction outlets like YouTube creator Wendigoon in its early days, but it soon found wider success elsewhere, particularly through two fan games based on the series, Maple County and the Mandela Invasion. These games weren't the catalyst for success themselves, but they became catalysts when they were played and recorded by popular YouTube creators Jacksepticeye and Markiplier in December 2021 and January 2022, the sixth and seventh most popular gaming YouTubers on the entire site. Similar to how the YouTube Let's Play success of the Slender the Eight Pages game in 2012 propelled the Marble Hornets series to success and turned it into a legend, Maple County and the Mandela Invasion game became popular outside of the unfiction sphere, and eventually led YouTubers and viewers back to the original source material, with both Jacksepticeye and Markiplier making reaction videos to the Mandela Catalog series after playing the fan games. These parallels to the Slenderverse run deep, and like the Slenderverse situation almost a decade ago, YouTube Let's Play coverage and reactions made the Mandela catalog essentially too big to die, and basically guaranteed its eternal popularity. I think that the coverage from people like Wendigoon and Corey Kenshin, and like even like Markiplier and Jacksepticeye were huge in my, in my growth, and I, I attribute like 50% of my success towards them, honestly. Maple County, which is the first fan game that really exploded, led to Markiplier playing it, which was absolutely huge. And then that led to him and Jacksepticeye watching the actual series itself. So I think that I think that connection with each other was really something that really surprised me, like pleasantly surprised me, um, especially since, well, I would say that Mandela Invasion was the first like official fan game, I would say at least because the names in the title and stuff and the dev even included photos of the alternates and stuff like that um i thought that that was really cool it, it makes me like I was, I was very enthusiastic to see what people could do in a video game setting when it comes to things that i've just made a series about i guess the mandela catalog is a big step in analog horror history our focus has been on numbers and inspiration and other concepts limited to unfiction but the Mandela Catalog not only had the single biggest impact within unfiction in at least the past decade, but it also pushed analog horror outside of unfiction. Mainstream audiences became aware of analog horror, and more aware of unfiction. A niche subgenre became known about by some of the biggest creators on all of YouTube, and spread across the internet as a whole, not just within niche communities. It's such a fascinating major development, and the series as a whole is another example of a creator pushing the limits of analog horror and unfiction's definitions. And the Mandela catalog will likely continue to shape the subgenre, especially as unfiction and analog horror develop and change in the wake of its impact. As the Mandela catalog began its rise to success, the godfather of the subgenre returned. Local 58, after being on hiatus since November 2019, came back in October 2021 with a full-fledged puzzle and lore-based ARG website, Local58.tv. The series that initially led analog horror away from ARGs was now becoming one, and audiences loved it. The website for Local 58, Local58.tv, I wanted there to be a space where um, um, people could go and receive you know, more lore and things like that, like flesh the world out, then not in a video format, because I feel like it could exist in other ways. 
With the ARG came a new upload on the Local 58 channel on October 31st, 2021, titled Digital Transition, which indicated that the future of the series may not be completely analog, but rather digital. And that's not the first time that the early digital age has come up, and it's something I'll touch on really soon. But at this moment, the resurgence and renewed interest in Local 58 made waves in the community. It was viewed as the return of the king. However, its overall impact was limited. Local 58 was the king, but Gemini Home Entertainment and the Mandela Catalog were the new trailblazers of analog horror, and they would remain that way. But there is one more trailblazer left to introduce before we catch up to the present day. On January 7th, 2022, YouTube creator Kane Pixels began his Backroom series. This almost entirely CGI analog horror video classifies itself as found footage, with a longer 10 minute runtime like a traditional short film, though some subsequent videos in this series focus on a more traditional analog horror format, like security camera footage and even instructional videos. And it's all incredibly well made. It's 10 minutes long and there's not an ounce of fat on it. Like I bought, I bought into 100% of it. Incredible, incredible editing. The Backrooms have been an internet legend since May 12th, 2019, when a 4chan post prompted several horror stories to be written about a liminal area known as the Backrooms. An infinite series of eerie hallways that you can get lost in if you glitch through the universe. Sometimes these stories say that the hallways are empty, and sometimes they don't. And the hallways Kane Pixels created definitely weren't empty. He crafted his own unique Backrooms narrative, not explicitly based on any previous internet stories, and he did it all in an animation software called Blender. The first of these videos went viral incredibly quickly, and further entries in the series have also been met with immense attention and success, making the Backrooms the most popular analog horror series ever, in the shortest amount of time ever. It's a situation similar to the Mandela Catalog, but on a somehow even faster timescale, thanks to analog horror's unprecedented dominance. The Backrooms is groundbreakingly successful, unexpectedly realistic, visually stunning, incredibly well made, and genuinely unique. There's nothing else like it in the analog horror subgenre, even if you go back to real found footage films like VHS. Kane uses the analog aesthetic and the found footage format in a more refined, skillful way than almost all of those films and other analog horror web series, while also surpassing them in terms of success. The Kane Pixels thing, that really was when I had a moment like, oh my god, like, analog horror has become massive. Like, massive, massive, because he blew up fast. As a fully mature subgenre, we are beginning to see some truly wild ideas coming from the analog horror scene. A new rising star, Midwest Angelica, is experimenting with incredibly unique and complex visuals, and staying remarkably true to the 1980s. And on a wider scale, the sea of Gemini Home Entertainment, Mandela Catalog, and Backrooms clones are endless, as analog horror not only dominates unfiction, but YouTube and the entire internet as a whole. And now, after this entire history, after all of the series and concepts and ideas and events and questions, the only one that remains is, what does the future look like? How does this story end? So the future of the subgenre, it's bloated right now. It's getting really big, but that doesn't mean it's going to be all bad because there's so many people going into it. There's definitely going to be some gold nuggets coming out of it. I think that the future of analog horror is, is mostly going to be what, what directions the big series are going to take. Pretty much all, all, the, all the series on my wall has taken some kind of big change recently, at least from what I think Local 58 is hinting at. They're going for more of a digital route. The Walton Files is going in more of a cinematic direction. I would be fascinated to see more of a take on a, like a multimedia um, approach where it's not confined to uh, a video, um, where it's allowed to exist in other social media and other formats. There's so much that you can do with getting like a website or something and doing something with that, mixing it with 
like video. Uh, like there's so many like little things you can do. There are so many cool spaces waiting to be incorporated or mixed or mashed up uh, that we have not seen yet. What are they going to do with that? different from all of the rest of hundreds of series that there probably are on YouTube. I think that that's what's going to determine what the future is. And that can be all inclusive. That can be written. It can be a single image. It can be audio. So much to be done. Uh, I think it would be really cool to see uh, it, it split off in those directions. You have to do something like with your work to make it stand out. In the end, in the long run, it's gonna stabilize and the people who make it and they don't find any success will obviously stop. There's always a new trend and this is what it is. It is a trend. It's a trend that has ascended to a subgenre and that subgenre will be here to stay and it will have its ebbs and flows and high tides and low tides of popularity and people making content for it. And it will eventually get a nostalgia period, but it's the flavor of the month. I think we are past the golden age already. We're going to the silver age. We're dipping down. There's going to be less and less um, gold nuggets to be found. There's going to be a lot of parodies coming out soon. It's going to get lower and lower and lower and lower until it kind of tapers off at a certain level of popularity. We will have something that comes through, that is revolutionary, that is exciting, that is thrilling, and will keep the game going, and we will have a new flavor of the month. And this is not to besmirch anything that becomes the flavor of the month. These things become popular for a reason. I'm no Nostradamus, okay? I'm just predicting off of like my experience with the Slenderverse. There's definitely going to be diehard fans who stick to it, and I'm definitely going to be one of them. If you want any indication of how this is going to go, simply look at Slenderverse. And there will be generations, like there are people right now who are calling themselves Gen 3 of Slenderverse creation. Stuff goes on. And then it does become more background hum projects. And they have their own following, they have their own measures of success, and that's just the order of the day. But Slenderverse is an excellent way to view it. It will be blazing hot for a short time, it will be warm for about as long, and then it will cool down and become a background staple. Every few years, someone comes along and radically reinvents the genre. They could be you. I'm just going to keep on working on my little projects. Don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to break that mold because there has been a lot of, of uh, analog horror that's that's kind of come up lately and I love checking them out still. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, I, I do miss the, the other stuff too. It's not awesome in my eyes to only ever chase a trend and the longer we stay stuck on a trend is dependent on how many people are looking at it and saying, I just want to make that, instead of following through with their vision. Because the next trend could be whatever you make. Because you dared to defy the trend. Because you defied what the flavor of the month is currently. And then you kick off a brand new fascination and excitement in a field of art. And that's for any medium. Any medium at all. That's one of the things I absolutely adore about this field is you have no idea what someone is going to create next. And that is so exciting. Analog horror didn't hit the ground running. It took almost a decade to gain true popularity, and then a few more years to innovate beyond Local 58. And then, not long until it blew up beyond anyone's wildest expectations, and beyond the previous confines of unfiction. But now, we're seeing more and more interesting, high-quality, experimental projects coming out of the subgenre. The Mandela Catalog and the Backrooms are examples of what this experimentation can bring, and hopefully of what we'll continue to see. It's something truly unprecedented. But the future of analog horror, and how this all ends, remains to be seen. Going back to the best analog to analog horror, the Slenderverse rose in 2010 and 2011, and fell shortly after the midpoint of the decade, with only a small handful of projects left and a few new ones starting. Meanwhile, Twitter ARGs exploded in 2018 after the sun vanished, but have been reduced to a trickle by 2022, less than five years later. Unfiction, and the internet as a whole, is not a space where trends stay in place permanently. They have their moment, 
and then they're reduced to a trickle of contributions from hardcore fans. However, analog horror has risen to unprecedented success beyond any other unfiction subgenre. Predicting where it's going is no easy task. However, analog horror rose to success at this specific time, under these specific conditions within unfiction and the internet, and within culture and world events. It rose on the back of nostalgia for a bygone age. The analog age. And now, in the same way that people longing for their memories of the analog age led to the birth of analog horror, only to be taken over by younger audiences with no memory of it, Young creators are now beginning to venture into recreating mediums from the early 2000s, the turn of the millennium, longing for their childhood memories of the early digital age, watching YouTube as a child, browsing a rougher, older form of the internet. It's been called digital horror, but a far more fitting, far less vague name would be millennium horror to refer to the time period the content is from. It's already being explored, whether it's one-off videos from Local 58, Alex Kansas, and Alex Kister, to an entire second series by Remy Abode called Morley Grove. Millennium Horror is the modern recreation of a mid-2000s internet Windows Movie Maker style digital-based aesthetic, based on nostalgia, used for the purposes of creating horror. For all intents and purposes, it's the same concept as analog horror, just executed differently. And we're still in its earliest days mere months into its lifespan. Who knows where it'll go? It's still too early to tell, but it could be the next big subgenre, or perhaps even Gen 3 of the analog horror subgenre, depending on how it evolves and how the community at large chooses to classify it. It's also possible that high-budget attempts and genuine live-action 80s recreations within analog horror like Omega Mart will also become more common and act as the next generation. But Millennium Horror is already on the rise, and it is very likely to be the next big thing. For now though, there is plenty of time for new stories to be told, more scares to be had, and more creative, unique analog horror projects to come to fruition. The subgenre has been expanding for a long time. Depending on how you define it, 15 years since the Wyoming incident, or 84 years since War of the Worlds in 1938. It may be declining in a silver age, or at the peak of its popularity in a golden age, or maybe it's still climbing and we haven't yet reached the peak. What may have been written off as a trend, a niche subgenre, or an annoying cliche has become the single most impactful development in all of unfiction. It's brought unfiction as a whole into a new age. An age of young fans being exposed to the past. An age of new creators taking their first steps into unfiction and filmmaking thanks to the low barrier of entry. An age of nostalgia-based stories and analog horror dominance from broadcast TV to VHS to early generation gaming. And as insane as it sounds, it's brought unfiction into an age of, at least relative to YouTube's scale, somewhat mainstream success. Unfiction, a concept which has never been mainstream, a concept that may never actually be mainstream, and may never need to be. But analog horror has brought it further into the spotlight than anything ever has. It's taken over the entire medium. It's exposed hundreds of thousands of new people to unfiction. It's impacted everyone who is part of unfiction, and its growth has been so important so impactful, and so truly unprecedented and spectacular to see. The history of analog horror is long, complicated, and hard to document. The definitions are confusing and lengthy and sometimes too conceptual to even follow. But in the end, after going through its past, after hearing from the key creators behind it all, and after trying harder than ever to define, explain, and figure out every aspect, mechanism, and mystery of the subgenre, I've gained a deeper appreciation for it, and its impact on the unfiction community. Its impact on new creators, its impact on the spread of the medium, and its impact on the internet as a whole. And I hope you have too, because it's been a long, long journey to get here. And it's not over yet.